Communion, an extraordinary true story by Whitley Strieber. This nationally recognized author describes his effort to deal with and explain a shattering assault from the unknown. This is Roddy McDowell. It is my great pleasure to tell you this story in the author's own words. To all appearances, I have had an elaborate personal encounter with intelligent non-human beings. But who could they be? And where have they come from? Are unidentified flying objects real? Are there goblins or demons or visitors? At first I thought I was losing my mind, but I was interviewed by three psychologists and three psychiatrists, given a battery of psychological tests and a neurological examination, and found to fall within the normal range in all respects. I was given a polygraph by an operator with 30 years' experience, and I passed without qualification. The visitors marched right into the middle of the life of an indifferent skeptic without a moment's hesitation. Later, I found a large number of people who have had experiences similar to mine. Most of them were mentally stable. They did not cluster in any particular population group, but formed a cross-section of American society. In my case, there were witnesses and physical after-effects that are hard to ignore. Either what is happening is that visitors are actually here, or the human mind is creating something that incredibly is close to a physical reality. Whatever it is, it is not presently understood by science. What happened to me was terrifying. It seemed completely real. It was in clear, normal memory. Most of it was already present in my mind before I was hypnotized to aid recall. I suffered with this experience. Others suffered and are still suffering. It is essential that effective support be developed to aid those who have it. The scoffing has to stop. People who face the visitors report fierce little figures with eyes that seem to stare into the deepest core of being. And those eyes are asking for something, perhaps even demanding it. Whatever it is, it is more than simple information. The goal does not seem to be the sort of clear and open exchange that we might expect. Whatever may be surfacing, it wants far more than that. It seems to me that it seeks the very depth of soul. It seeks communion. My wife and I own a log cabin in a secluded corner of upstate New York. It is in this cabin that our primary experiences have taken place. I will deal first with what I remember of December the 26th, 1986. This part of my narrative, covering December the 26th, is derived from journal material I had written before undergoing any hypnosis or even discussing my situation with anybody. Our cabin is very hidden and quiet. Part of a small group of cabins scattered across an area served by a private dirt road, which itself branches off a little-used country road that leads to an old town that isn't even mentioned on many maps. We spend more than half our time at the cabin because I do most of my work there. We also have an apartment in New York City. Ours is a very sedate life. We don't go out much, we rarely drink more than wine, and neither of us has ever used drugs. From 1977 until 1983, I wrote imaginative thrillers, but in recent years I had been concentrating on much more serious fiction about peace and the environment books that were firmly grounded in fact. Thus, at this time in my life, I wasn't even working on horror stories, and at no time have I ever been in danger of being deluded by them. We were having a lovely Christmas at the cabin in late December 1985. After our son went to bed, Anne and I sat quietly together listening to some music and reading. About 8.30, I turned on the burglar alarm, which covers every accessible window and all the doors. For no reason then apparent, I had developed an unusual habit the previous fall. As secretly as ever, I made a tour of the house, peering in closets and even looking under the guest room bed for hidden intruders. I did this immediately after setting the alarm. By 10 o'clock, we were in bed 
and by eleven both of us were asleep. The night of the 26th was cold and cloudy. There were perhaps eight inches of snow on the ground, and it was still falling lightly. In the middle of the night of December the 26th, I do not know the exact time, I abruptly found myself awake, and I knew why. I heard a peculiar whooshing, swirling noise coming from the living room downstairs. There was no random creak, no settling of the house, but a sound as if a large number of people were moving rapidly around in the room. I sat up in bed, shocked and very curious. The night was dead still, windless. My eyes went straight to the burglar alarm panel beside my bed. The system was armed and working perfectly. Not a covered window or door was opened, and nobody had entered, at least according to the row of glowing lights. Now, what I did next may seem peculiar. I settled back in bed. For some reason, the extreme strangeness of what I was hearing did not rouse me to action. No sooner had I settled back than I noticed that one of the double doors leading into our bedroom was moving closed. As they closed outward, this meant that the opening was getting smaller, concealing whatever was behind that door. I sat up again. I felt wide awake and in full possession of all my faculties. I could not imagine what could be going on, and I got very uneasy. What could be moving the door? Then I saw, edging around it, a compact figure. It was so distinct, and yet so completely, impossibly astonishing, that at first I could not understand it at all. I simply sat there, staring, too stunned to move. This figure was too small to be a person, unless a child. I believe that it was roughly three and a half feet tall, altogether smaller and lighter than my son. I could see perhaps a third of the figure, uh, the part that was bending around the door so that it could see me. It had a smooth, rounded hat on with an odd, sharp rim that jutted out easily four inches on the side I could see. Below this was a vague area. I could not see the face, or perhaps I would not see it. A few moments later, when it was close to the bed, I saw two dark holes for eyes and a black down-turning line of a mouth that later became an O. From shoulder to midriff, was the visible third of a square plate etched with concentric circles. This plate stretched from just below the chin to the waist area. At the time, I thought it looked like some sort of breastplate or even an armoured vest. Beneath it was a rectangular appliance of the same type, which covered the lower waist to just above the knees. The angle at which the individual was leaning was such that the lower legs were hidden behind the door, in any case, I sat there, frightened but unable or unwilling to deal with what I was observing. Because of its isolation, the house not only had a burglar alarm but contained a shotgun, which was not far from the bed at the time. Was that why the thing behind the door was wearing a shield, if that was indeed what it was? The next thing I knew, the figure came rushing into the room. I recall only blackness after that for an unknown period of time. I don't remember falling asleep or lying awake. What I do remember is far, far more disturbing. My next conscious recollection is of being in motion. I was naked with my arms and legs extended, as if I had been frozen in mid-leap. I was moving out of the room, there was no physical sensation at all, not of being touched, not of being warm or cold. I could feel myself as a shape and a mass, but not in terms of sensation. It was as if I had become profoundly paralyzed. Although I wanted desperately to move, I could not. I was, at this point, in a state of panic. Something was hideously wrong, so wrong that my mind went blank. I couldn't think. Even if I had been able to make a sound, which I doubt, I couldn't try. I must have blacked out again because I have no further memories of being moved. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in a sort of 
a depression in the woods. It was quite dark, and Frozen Creeper was pressing tightly around me. I remember being startled that there was no snow on the grey earth. I sat with my legs partly bent and my hands in my lap. Although I cannot recall this in any detail, I may have been leaning against something. I was still absent sensation. Across the depression to my left there was a small individual whom I could see only out of the corner of my eye. This person was wearing a grey tan bodysuit and sitting on the ground with knees drawn up and hands clasped around them. There were two dark eye holes and a round mouth hole. I had the impression of a face mask. I felt that I was under the exact and detailed control of whomever had me. I could not move my head or my hands or any part of my body save for my eyes. Immediately on my right was another figure, this one completely invisible except for an occasional flash of movement. This person was working busily at something that seemed to have to do with the right side of my head. It wore dark blue coveralls and was extremely fast. While the presence of others remains vague in my mind, the individual to my left made a clear impression. I do not know why, but I had the distinct feeling that this was a woman, and so I shall refer to her in the feminine. She was as small as the others and appeared almost bored or indifferent. I also felt that she was explaining something to me, but I cannot remember what it was. Then I saw branches moving past my face, then a sweep of treetops. I looked down, and below me the whole tall forest was corkscrewing slowly to the right. Th there was no chance to question how in the world I'd gotten above the trees. I only saw and recorded. Then a grey floor obscured my vision, slipping below my feet like an iris closing. The next thing I knew... I was sitting in a messy round room. My impression is, at this point, I was actually being cradled by these people, as if they were aware of what was about to transpire. While I had up until that point been able to retain a degree of control of my attention, this now left me and I became entirely given over to extreme dread. The fear was so powerful that it seemed to make my personality completely evaporate. I do not think that my ordinary humanity survived the transition to this little room. I died, and a wild animal appeared in my place. Not everything was gone, though. What remained, although small, nevertheless was occupied with an essential task of verification. I was looking around as best I could, recording what I saw. The small, circular chamber had a domed, greyish-tan ceiling with ribs appearing at intervals of about a foot. Across the room to my right, some clothing was thrown on the floor. As a matter of fact, the thought even crossed my mind that the place was actually dirty. The whole scale of it was small, tight, enclosed. Tiny people were now moving around me at a great speed. Their quickness was disturbing, and in a curious way, ugly. An acute, gnawing feeling of being in a trap overcame me. It was a truly awful sensation, accompanied as it was by the sense that I was absolutely helpless in the hands of these strange creatures. I was seated on a bench, leaning against a wall. The predominant colours were tan and grey. The bench was the same colour as the walls and was rimmed by a lip of dark brown. There was something quite beautiful, I think, having to do with a lens in the ceiling, uh, but I can remember little about it. Perhaps there was a lens at the point of the ceiling through which some colourful scene could be observed. There was no way to be certain of how long I remained in this room, it seemed to be a stay of no more than a few minutes or even seconds. It may have been longer, though, uh, because I had time to look around me and note numerous details. While I had 
before been totally paralyzed, I was now able to move at least my eyes and possibly my head. One being was on my right, another on my left. Within my field of vision, a great deal of rushing about commenced again. The next thing I knew, I was being shown a tiny grey box with a sliding lid. There was a curved lip at one end of this box to make it easy to push it open. It was being held by a thin, graceful person whose appearance was not distinct. My memory of the one that came before me next is of a tiny, squat person crouching as if huddled over something. He had been given the box and now slid it open, revealing an extremely shiny, hair-thin needle mounted on a black surface. This needle glittered when I saw it out of the corner of my eye, but it was practically invisible straight on. I became aware I think I was told, that they proposed to insert this into my brain. If I had been afraid before, I now became quite simply crazed with terror. I argued with them. Look, this place is filthy, I remembered saying. Then, you'll ruin a beautiful mind. A great sadness overtook me. I do not recall screaming, but evidently I was doing so because... I remember the next exchange quite clearly. One of them, I think it was the one I'd identified earlier as the woman, said, What can we do to help you stop screaming? This voice was remarkable. It had a subtly electronic tone to it, the accents flat and startlingly Midwestern. My reply was unexpected. I heard myself say, You could let me smell you. I was embarrassed. This was not a normal request, uh, it, and it bothered me. But it made a great deal of sense, as I have afterward realized. The one to my right replied, OK, OK, I could do that, in a similar voice, speaking very rapidly, and held his hand against my face, cradling my head with his other hand. The odor was distinct and gave me exactly what I needed an anchor in reality. There was a slight scent of cardboard about it, as, as if the sleeve of the coverall that was partly pressed against my face were made of some substance like paper. The hand itself had a faint but distinctly organic sourness in its odour. It was not a human smell, but it was unmistakably the smell of something alive. There was a subtle overtone that seemed a little like cinnamon, the next thing I knew, there was a bang and a flash, and I realized that they had performed the proposed operation on my head. I felt like weeping, and I recalled sinking down into a cradle of tiny arms. Then I was lifted up and seemed suddenly to be in another room, or perhaps I simply saw my present surroundings differently. It appeared to be a small operating theater. I was in the center of it, on a table, and three tiers of benches were populated with a few huddled figures, some with round as opposed to slanted eyes. I was aware that I had seen four different types of figures. The first was the small robot-like being that had led the way into my bedroom. He was followed by a large group of short, stocky ones in the dark blue overalls. These had wide faces appearing either dark grey or dark blue in that light, with glittering deep-set eyes, pug noses, and broad, somewhat human mouths. Inside the room I encountered two types of creature uh, that did not look at all human. The most provocative of these was about five feet tall, very slender and delicate, with extremely prominent and mesmerizing black slanted eyes. This being had an almost vestigial mouth and nose. The huddled figures in the theatre were somewhat smaller, with similarly shaped heads, but round, black eyes, like large buttons. Throughout the whole experience, the stocky ones were always present. They were apparently responsible for moving and controlling me, and I had the distinct impression that they were a sort of good army. Why good, I do not know. 
I do not remember what, if anything, happened in the operating theatre. Uh, my memories of movement from place to place are the hardest to recall because it was then that I felt the most helpless. My fear would rise when they touched me. Their hands were soft, even soothing. But there were so many of them that it felt a little as if I was being passed along by rows of insects. It was very distressing. Soon I was in more intimate surroundings once again. There were clothes strewn about, and two of the stocky ones drew my legs apart. The next thing I knew, I was being shown an enormous and extremely ugly object, grey and scaly, with a sort of network of wires on the end. It was at least a foot long, narrow, and triangular in structure. They inserted this thing into my rectum. It seemed to swarm into me as if it had a life of its own. At the time, I had the impression that I was being raped, and for the first time, I felt anger. Only when this thing was withdrawn did I see that it was a mechanical device. The individual holding it pointed to the wire cage on the tip and seemed to warn me about something. But what? I never found out. One of them took my right hand and made an incision on my forefinger. There was no pain at all. Abruptly, my memories end. There isn't even blackness. Just mourning. I awoke the morning of the 27th very much as usual, but grappling with a distinct sense of unease and a very improbable but intense memory of seeing a barn owl staring at me through the window sometime during the night. I remember how I felt in the gathering evening of the 27th when I looked out onto the roof and saw that there were no owl tracks in the snow. I knew I had not seen an owl. But I wanted desperately to believe in that owl. I told my wife about it. She was polite, but commented about the absence of tracks. I really very much wanted to convince her of it, though. Even more, I wanted to convince myself. From that first day, my wife noticed a dramatic personality change in me, which she thought was similar to a change that had taken place the previous October. We had gone through personal hell then because of my demands and my accusatory behavior, and she did not want that pattern to repeat itself. That first evening, I underwent the initial physical symptom of my ordeal. We had come in from an afternoon of light cross-country skiing, not at all strenuous. I was dead tired. I got chills and went to bed. I thought I must have a high fever. Then our nearest neighbors arrived. They appeared without warning. We tend to be very private in our sparse community, and this was only their second spontaneous visit in the two years that we have been neighbors. Feeling somewhat better, I went downstairs to see them. No sooner had we started talking than I found myself complaining that I thought I had seen a light of a snowmobile in the woods between our houses about three in the morning. I was horrified at myself. What was I saying? I couldn't remember any such thing, and I knew it even as I spoke. Our neighbors offered the thought that the woods were too thick for the snowmobile to maneuver, which is true. My memory of the snowmobile was as hollow as my memory of the owl. After some small talk, our neighbors went home. I was not pleased with my own behavior, and I found it hard to understand because it seemed so non-volutional, almost as if I had been talking against my will. I did not know that the owl and the light were screen memories that concealed a traumatic experience. As described by Freud, the screen memory is a method that the mind uses to shield itself from things too upsetting to recall. At the time, I had no idea that I was suffering from emotional trauma or that dozens of other people had been through very similar ordeals after having been taken by the visitors. My mental and physical states continued to get worse. An infection appeared on my right forefinger. It looked like a splinter injury, but I could not remember getting a splinter, unless it was from some log I'd carried in for the stove. The injury festered. Neither iodine nor antibiotic ointment seemed to help. I looked for a bit of splinter, but could find nothing. 
I noticed that I was uncomfortable sitting because of rectal pain, a weird and disturbing symptom. In the ensuing days, I experienced more bouts of fatigue. I would be working and suddenly would get cold and start to shake. Then I would feel so exhausted that I could not go on and crawl into bed, quivering and miserable, sure that I was coming down with the flu. Nights I would sleep, but wake up in the morning feeling as if I had been tossing and turning the whole time. I ceased to dream, and sometimes had difficulty closing my eyes. I felt watched, and kept hearing noises in the night. Mornings I would wake up with the feeling that I had been somehow on guard. My disposition got worse. I became mercurial frantic with excitement about some idea one moment and despair the next. I was suspicious of friends and family, often openly hostile. On the afternoon of January the 3rd, we were skiing when I got a pain behind my right ear. My skull ached and my skin was sensitive. In the middle of this sensitive area, my wife could see a tiny pinpoint of a scab. I believe that the combination of the infected finger, the rectal pain, and the aching head were what finally brought my memories into focus. The confused swirl resolved into a specific series of recollections, and when I saw what they were, I just about exploded with terror and utter disbelief. One of the memories would come into my head, linger there for a moment, then leave me with my heart pounding, gasping, sweat pouring down my face. I thought I had lost my mind. For half of my life I have been engaged in a rigorous and detailed search for a finer state of consciousness. Now I thought my mind was turning against me, that my years of eager study of everything from Zen to quantum physics had led me into some strange and tragic byway of the soul. For a couple of days, I lived with it. Maybe the symptoms would subside. Then, quite suddenly, one afternoon, I recall the smell. Their smell. It came back to me as clearly as if I had inhaled it not a moment before. That totally real memory saved me from going stark, raving mad. In the first week of January, a local newspaper published the accounts of an object, or objects, being cited in our area. The headline called the appearance a hoax. But according to the story, local people who had witnessed the event doubted that. As it happens, the 18-year-old son of one of our neighbours saw something hovering near a road not five miles from our cabin at approximately 9.30 on a night in late December, he described it to me as huge and covered with lights. Being the son of a former state trooper and pilot, he did not claim that it was a UFO, but simply told the truth. He did not know what it was, but it appeared to be a solid structure, and as it hovered for a substantial period, more than 15 minutes, it could not have been a flight of planes. Research revealed to us that our area of upstate New York, comprising roughly Westchester, Orange, Putnam, Rockland, and Ulster counties, had an absolutely extraordinary series of sightings of boomerang, or triangular-shaped objects of enormous size, starting in 1983. Town police officers, sheriffs, state troopers, even in one case an entire town government en masse, viewed the things which have been described as being the size of an aircraft carrier. When we went to New York City for a stay in January, we still knew almost nothing about UFOs and nothing at all about these sightings. Life did not return to normal. I felt a little better, but I was terribly uneasy. My difficulty relating to my wife and son continued. I read a book my brother had sent me for Christmas called Science and the UFOs by Jenny Randalls and the astronomer Peter Warrington. Toward the end of the book, I was astonished to read a description of an experience similar to my own. When I read the author's version of the archetypal abduction experience, 
I was shocked. They were talking about people who think they've been taken aboard spaceships by aliens. And I seem to be such a person. My blood went cold. I decided just to lock the business away in my mind. A few mornings later, at about ten, I was sitting at my desk when things just seemed to cave in on me. Wave after wave of sorrow passed over me. I looked at the window with hunger. I wanted to jump. I wanted to die. I just could not bear this memory. I could not get rid of it. What on earth were those things? What had they done to me? I remembered that a man named Bud Hopkins had been mentioned in the book as a prominent researcher in the field. I found his name in the phone book. I called Bud Hopkins. He answered the phone and listened to my story for a few minutes. I thought I would wither away with embarrassment telling it, but soon he interrupted me. Could I come over, like right now? Hopkins was a large, intense man with one of the kindest faces I had ever seen. The moment our interview began, Hopkins explained that he was not a therapist, but he could put me in touch with one if I wanted that. As I sat in that man's living room, listening to him tell me that I wasn't alone, that others had gone through very much the same thing, the tears rolled down my cheeks, and I went from wanting to hide it all to wanting to understand it. It was during that first meeting that he asked me if anything else had happened in the past, anything unusual. The question seemed to trigger something in me. After a moment's reflection, I blurted out, I seem to remember a night the house burned down, but it didn't burn down. All hell had broken loose on a night in early October. There had been an explosion that woke up the whole household. Strange things had happened, but, for some unknown reason, we had simply put them out of mind. We hardly even discussed them. But that time, they didn't happen only to me. We had house guests. If anything had really happened, they would certainly remember. I'd contact the witnesses. They would, of course, report that they remembered nothing. Then I would begin the painful but thankfully well-understood process of accepting that I had been the victim of some sort of unusual mental phenomenon. I would enter therapy and learn to forget the mysterious visitors. But why had I not thought of or discussed the events of October the 4th before? In retrospect, the only reason I can advance is that I did not want to face just how strange the events of that night had really been. But when I thought them over, they began to seem distinctly eerie, even frightening. We often deal with fear by rejection, and in this case, as will soon be evident, there was more than enough reason to be terrified. On October the 4th, 1985, my wife, son, and I drove up to our cabin in the company of two close friends, Jacques Sandalescu and Annie Gottlieb. We have known Jacques and Annie for about five years. He weighs nearly 300 pounds, is a black belt in karate, and does a hundred push-ups at a session. She is also a black belt, but weighs perhaps 120 pounds. She is intellectual, he is physical. Both are writers. The night of October the 4th was foggy in Ulster County. We had dinner at a local restaurant and arrived at the cabin at about nine in the evening. I turned on the pool heater so that the pool would be comfortable for use the next day. Then I lit a fire in the wood stove. We were all sleepy, so sleepy that we went off to bed almost immediately. Anne and I retired to our upstairs bedroom. Jacques and Annie went to the guest room and closed the door, and our son went to his corner bedroom beside theirs. He left his door open. From my bed, with the bedroom doors open, I could see out across the cathedral ceiling of the living room to a hexagonal window set in the peak of the roof. Over the next hour, the fog grew thicker and thicker. When I turned out my reading light, I was enveloped in absolute blackness and total silence. I slept dreamlessly for a period of time, perhaps as much as two or three hours. Then... I was startled awake and saw, to my horror, 
that there was a distinct blue light being cast on the living room ceiling. I was frightened because it wasn't possible for there to be any light there. Car lights from the road could not be cast on that ceiling. My mind inventoried the possibilities as I watched this blue light slowly creep up the ceiling as if whatever was causing it was slowly moving down into the front yard from above. Finally, I hit on what seemed to me a sensible solution. The chimney must be on fire and dropping sparks into the front yard. I had to do something about it at once. Then I fell into a deep sleep. The last thought I remember before dropping off, with my heart still hammering, was that the roof was on fire. I do not know what time this all took place, but it was well after midnight. Sometime after I fell back to sleep, I was awakened again, this time by a loud report, as if a firecracker had popped in my face. My wife cried out, and downstairs my son began shouting. When I opened my eyes, I was stunned to see that the entire house was surrounded by a glow that extended into the fog. I thought to myself, you damned fool, you fell asleep, and now the fire's gotten worse. I finally managed to get up. As I did so, I said to Anne, the roof's on fire. I'll get our son and wake up the others. I started downstairs. I hadn't gotten halfway across the room before the glow suddenly disappeared. I was very confused. There was nothing to do but to tell Anne that I had made a mistake, then go downstairs and comfort my son. On the way, I met Jacques in the hall. His presence terrified me, and I jumped back away from him. Then I apologized for being so startled by a friend, told him to calm down and go to bed, and added that nothing was wrong. I continued into my son's room and embraced him. In a few minutes... I was back in bed, and the household was again asleep. The next morning, little was said about the incident. I do not remember Annie mentioning that Jacques had been bothered by the light the night before. I didn't understand that because their bedroom door had been closed, they couldn't have seen the bathroom light, which is left on for our son. I didn't remember my confusion about the fire. As far as I was concerned... Annie and Jacques had been disturbed by the light, but I hadn't been. Later that week, I found myself a little agitated without knowing quite why. I had a persistent memory of light flashing in my eyes that night, and I vaguely recalled some sort of an explosion. The next weekend, I had a very clear and dramatic memory of a huge crystal standing on end above the house, a glorious thing, hundreds of feet tall, glowing with an unearthly blue light. I told Anne about it, and as I was talking, I experienced a hollow sort of feeling. I knew that she didn't believe me. Of course she didn't. And I didn't believe myself. I put it out of my mind permanently. On February the 6th, 1986, I came home from Bud Hopkins' house brimming with eagerness. I was sure I would put an end to this by asking careful questions. I first asked my wife to think back to October the 4th. It wasn't hard to identify the specific night because it was the last time that Jacques and Annie had come to the country and the thickness of the fog was unusual. I was disturbed that Anne at once remembered being awakened by a bang. She did not see the glow, but my initial warning about the fire apparently didn't penetrate her sleep, because all she did recall was my saying that there was no fire. I asked my son, do you remember the last time that Jacques and Annie went to the country with us? Yeah, the night of the bang. So he had also heard it. A bunch of people told me it was okay. You just threw your shoe at the fly. What people? Oh, just a bunch of people. People who were around. This answer shocked me badly. I left off questioning him and called Bud Hopkins, who suggested that I ask my son not about memories, but about dreams. Taking this advice, I next asked my son if he remembered any unusual dreams. This was his reply, spontaneous and immediate. I dreamed that a bunch of little doctors took me out on the porch 
and put me on a cot. I got scared, and they started saying, we won't hurt you, over and over in my head. That is my strangest dream, because it was just like it was real. He could not say if he had had that dream on the night of October the 4th. He only knew that it had happened at the cabin. Next, I spoke to Jacques Santalesco on the phone. I asked, do you remember anything about the last time you and Annie came to the country? The light, he said. I was sleeping. All of a sudden, something woke me up. I saw the room was full of light, bright like daylight, not like the moon. I thought we overslept. I looked at my watch. It says 4.30. Then I hear you through the door saying it's okay. The light is gone, so I go back to sleep. Nothing I can conceive of can account for the major light phenomena on that night. I visualized the whole roof being ablaze. Jacques thought it was mid-morning. Because of the fog, a helicopter, or indeed any sort of airplane, was out of the question. And what about the explosion? Maybe it was thunder. But there were no thunderstorms in the area. Perhaps a freak bolt in some sort of unusual mini-storm caused it then. But the period of seeming daylight lasted many seconds and was not apparent to anybody until after the explosion. Thunder follows lightning, not the other way around. And so far there was no way at all to account for Annie Gottlieb's testimony. I spoke to her immediately after talking to Jacques. Like the rest of us, Annie was awakened by a loud explosion. She reports, It was a bang, and then I heard the scurry of little feet running across your bedroom upstairs. It must have been the cats. Annie, I said, the cats were in the city. We don't take them weekends because they don't like the carrier. You're kidding. I always just assumed it was the cats. Anyway, I vaguely remember the light. Mostly, I remember the noises. A few minutes after the scurrying... I heard you come downstairs. You said through the door not to worry. And the next morning you told me that some people had come down from a spaceship to visit. What, Annie? I never said any such thing. Well, now that I think of it, I don't know where I got the idea anybody said it. At that point, I almost wished that I had never asked my witnesses anything. I said goodbye and put the phone down. I realized finally and inescapably that something very peculiar was going on. I thought back across the months to October. The fall had been an awful time for me and my wife. Around the second week of October, I had become extremely fearful about living in the New York area and decided to move had my terror stemmed from that night? And what about all my nervousness, my secret searching under beds and in closets, my unreasonable fear of prowlers? It seemed to me that I had been growing increasingly uneasy with the passing months. The last week of October, I had decided that I couldn't live a moment longer in New York. I decided that I wanted to move to Austin. I went to the University of Texas there, and it was a city that both Anne and I love. After Halloween, we went down to Texas and arranged for our son to attend a local private school and began the process of buying a house. One evening in Austin, we were looking at the house we had chosen to buy. My wife was inside talking to the realtor and the owners, and I walked out onto the deck. When I looked at the dark canyon that stretched out into the shadows and the stars in the evening sky, I felt suddenly and absolutely afraid. It was exactly as if the sky were a living thing, and it was watching me. What was even more frightening was my clear awareness that this was a paranoid fantasy. I thought then that my mental health was not good, and soon I would either have to calm down or take steps to improve it. But I could not live in that house, in fact, I could never enter it again. When I changed my mind and decided to stay in New York, my wife was understandably furious. Then I accused her of being the one who had wanted to move us to Austin. There followed a crisis. She really thought she might have to leave me because life together was just getting intolerable. 
but we are a deep marriage, and her despairing threat to separate made me quell my extreme behavior. It was not until Christmas that I really began to feel better. Now I took stock of all I had found out. Judging from what the other witnesses reported, something had happened. But what? I had no idea what had gone on that night. There did seem to be a lot of confusion, though, and perhaps even an emotional response on my part greatly out of proportion to what seemed a minor disturbance. My next step was clear. I was going to become involved with a therapist. The ideal therapist would have an open mind. I could have a mental problem. It might or might not have components unknown to science. Because of the evident presence of fear-induced memory lapses and even possible amnesia, this therapist would have to be a skilled hypnotist as well. Hopkins remembered that Dr. Donald Klein of the New York State Psychiatric Institute had expressed interest in the phenomenon and appeared to be open-minded about it. I looked up Dr. Klein's credentials and found them to be superb. A few weeks later, I was in his office undergoing a searching three-hour pre-interview. We worked for some time trying to find ways into my mind, but I could recall little more than I already had. At his suggestion, I spent a week trying to do so. When I was not successful, we decided on a trial hypnosis session. I was very much hoping that the process would dispel the whole notion of the visitors and prove that, despite appearances, the experience had been a complicated series of misperceptions. We just don't know enough about hypnosis to call it a completely trustworthy scientific tool in a situation like this. While Don Klein certainly didn't ask provocative questions, there was always the possibility that I was unconsciously eager to comply with an outcome that I might secretly have longed for. I did not believe in UFOs at all before this happened, and I would have laughed in the face of anybody who claimed contact. And yet my experience happened to me, and much of it is recorded not in an unconscious context, but in ordinary memory. Donald Klein met me in his subdued gray office on East 79th Street in Manhattan. He is a tall man with curly hair and a quiet demeanor. Two things were immediately apparent to me about him as a hypnotist. First, I sensed command. He was confident of his skills. Second, he was a thorough, careful man with a very acute mind. I had never been hypnotized before, and I was apprehensive about it. As it turned out, my apprehension was for the wrong reasons. I was afraid of relinquishing control over myself, which seemed deeply disturbing. Control, as may be imagined, was a central issue in a life such as the one I had been leading. I found, though, that I trusted Don Klein when he told me that even under hypnosis, people cannot be readily compelled to say things they do not want to say. I would not be out of control, not really. The process of becoming hypnotized was pleasant. I sat in a comfortable chair. Dr. Klein stood before me and asked me to look up at his finger, which was placed so that I had almost to roll my eyes into my head to see it. He moved it from side to side and suggested that I relax. No more than half a minute later, it seemed, I was unable to hold my eyes open. Then he began saying that my eyelids were getting heavy and they did indeed get heavy. The next thing I knew, my eyes were closed. At that point, I felt relaxed and calm, but not asleep. I was aware of my surroundings. I could feel my face growing slack, and soon Dr. Klein began to say that my right hand was getting warm. It got warm, and then he progressed to my arm, and then my whole body. I was now sitting totally comfortable, encased in warmth. I still felt as if I had a will of my own, a sensation that was never to leave me. In fact, the hypnotized subject does have a will of his own, very much so, but he is also open to suggestion. After some preliminary questions, Dr. Klein proceeded to the afternoon of October the 4th. I wish to add that Bud Hopkins was present at both of these sessions, recording them. 
He was allowed to ask questions, but only at the end of each session, and it was understood that his questions would be few. All the other questions were put by Dr. Klein. Now, we are going to the beginning of the month of October, right around October the 1st, 1985. You have any plans for the weekend? Dr. Klein asked. Yes, we're going to take Jacques and Annie up to the country, and I don't know whether or not Jacques is going to fit in the jeep. Now you're driving up to the country? Yeah. We're not having any problems. Annie's very small, so Jacques can fit. I put on a tape, but nobody liked it, so we talked. I'm going to take you all out to dinner tonight. We're going to the top of the falls. Go forward to that time now. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm enjoying myself thoroughly. How far is the restaurant from your house? Oh, not long, about 15 minutes. And we had dinner. Oh, we had dinner. And our son all have, um... No, oh, I have a great time. Jacques has a good time. So you're back in the house, and you're going to bed for the night? Yeah. What happens after you go to bed? Well, uh, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night. Oh, uh, something went past the window. What the hell? Something went past the window. Something went past the window. There's nothing but... Uh, oh, God. Annie, the house... Something went past the window. Yeah, a big thing. No, it was a light. It didn't go past the window. I'm going back to sleep. I think the stove's okay. It was a light in the front yard. I keep thinking, who the hell is that? Is that somebody? Is there somebody there? R relax. Now, tell us what you saw. I saw something that looked like it had a hood on it standing over by the wall in, near the corner in our bedroom, and I don't want it to be there. What's it doing to me? Stop! Oh, no, stop! I then emerged spontaneously from hypnosis. Oh, God, I said. You know, I didn't know there was anything in my house till just this second, that night on the 4th of October, scared the devil out of me. Sorry about that. I didn't expect this to be that bad because I, I was prepared for being scared on the 26th. I did not know anything had come into my house. Oh, well. It was there. Can you tell us about it? It's like a little man with a hood on or something. There's no head. He's covered in something and comes over to the bed and he starts, like, sticking something in... Oh, no, not into my head, you understand, but, it, like, it's sticking into my mind. Uh, it, it would make a noise, like a voice, like it had a little thing it could touch to my head and it would make a voice. I swear to God, I just can't believe this happened. I'll tell you the light comes down past the window. Then I see a glow in the front yard. I thought I'd gotten up, but I don't think now that I did. I think I knew all along it was coming in the window, the glow, and I just didn't somehow want to say that because it was very obvious even then that it wasn't a fire, and he was... I just don't know what he was doing. That was very scary. I'm shaky, but... Do you want me to keep on? If you'd like to. Oh, I do, definitely. In a few more moments, I was hypnotized again. Dr. Klein was speaking. If you see something that is very frightening, you will remain asleep but you will tell us how you feel. The night of October the 4th, you have woken up. Tell me what you see. When he sees I see him, he comes over to the bed. He looks mean. He's little, looking down at me. Got eyes, big eyes, big slanted eyes. A bald head is looking down at me. He's got a ruler in his hand. 
has a tip of silver, touches me. I see pictures. I see pictures of the world just blowing up when he touches my head with this thing. Jesus, what is this about? What is it about? Well, I know you won't hurt me. Stop. Oh, the house is burning down. The house is on fire. No, it's not. Why did I say that? Something woke you up. What happened? I then emerged spontaneously from hypnosis. Explosion, I said. I was expecting it. I knew just when it would come. He took a little thing like a needle and stuck it like a match in front of my face and it made a big bang, pow! And I thought the house was on fire. This was the explosion that Anne and your son... I think it was the explosion that they all heard. He did it with a little needle stuck in the air, you know. I, I feel a tremendous relief right now. Oh, this is good to be able to remember. It's not an easy memory, but it's good to remember because I've been fighting to keep it out of my head. You said that the first figure seemed to be covered up like with a hood. You said it had a bald head. Well, you see, I can sort of see that it had a bald, rather largish head for someone that size, and that its eyes are slanted more than an oriental's eyes, uh, but they're quite... There's a piercing glare, almost. I'm not sure, but at some point, I almost thought it looks like a bug, uh, but not... Well, you know, more like a person than a bug. But there were bug-like qualities to it. Do you know what I've got to do? I've got to figure out how I feel about this because I don't think I'm intellectually going to be able to deny their existence much longer. The session ended with a decision to continue later in the week. The easy route would be to dismiss this material as entirely psychological. That would also be a mistake at least until the physical effects are explained completely in detail and satisfactorily. A terrifying thing happened to me. Perhaps it involved visitors from somewhere, maybe even from inside the human unconscious. For me, though, the most important thing about it was its essentially human effect. We met again a few days later. Bud Hopkins told me that the first hypnosis sessions were often traumatic. These memories are buried for a reason. They are frightful in the extreme. When they first emerge, the mind lives through the panic it has been avoiding. While my experience with the wand is almost unique, the being I saw wielding it is of a type commonly reported. It was during this week that I began to have a relationship with my own memories. There had been a being present. I had seen it, and I had seen others in December. I remembered the way they had smelled, the way it had felt to be carried by them, the way their place had looked inside. I felt complex emotions ranging from the deepest inner unrest to what I can only describe as an urgency to compliance. I wanted to come together with them on my terms to find some sort of mutuality. When I returned to Dr. Klein's office, I described myself as uneasy. We began the session covering December the 26th as soon as I was comfortable. Again, Bud Hopkins was present and allowed to question me. I want to take you back to December the 26th, Dr. Klein began, and you are having supper. You are going to talk to me now, but stay completely asleep. Where are you having supper? In the country, I responded. Tell me who's there. Anne and our son. How do you feel? I'm very happy. I'm feeling great. Had you been feeling great the previous few weeks? I had a hard time up until Christmas. was uh, scared unhappy. I felt like the world was caving in on me. Kept thinking there were those people hiding in the closet. Went all through the house every night, checking. 
Did you have any idea why you were searching? In case there might be somebody hiding in the house. Did your wife ask you why you were looking in the closet? No, she never saw. You hid that from her? Yeah, and from my boy. I've got a gun. When did you get that? October. We went to the gun store. What did you want it for? Protection. From what? Not sure. I just have the feeling sometimes there are people in the house. I'm going to take you forward in time uh, to the evening of the 26th. You're going up to bed to go to sleep. You're going to remain calm and tell me what happens. We go to sleep in bed. Give Anne kiss. Can hear the snow on the house. A little bit of snow. Turn out the light. The whole place fills with quiet. Go to sleep. Definitely think I hear him. I hear them. Comes right in the door. Looks like he's wearing cards. God damn, I can really see this. He looks like he's wearing cards. An oblong one down his middle. And he has on a round hat. And he's wearing a face mask with two eye holes and a round hole between them down toward the bottom. And he's moving real fast. And he makes. He stands beside my bed and makes a gesture to the door. And there's a hell of a lot of them. Filing into the room. I'm talking about a lot of them. They're not wearing cards. They're wearing over coveralls, blue. I can see their heads, which are bald. Time to get up. I get up. I'm scared, you see. I'm scared as hell. I take off my pajamas. Scariest to see Anne. I have to say goodbye to her now. There's two whole rows of them. I'm going out. They're moving me. Are they moving me from hand to hand? They're little bitty people. I was taken downstairs onto the front porch where I saw a sort of black iron cot. I don't like the look of that thing. That's a cot, or like a bed, only it's for me. Oh, I feel sick inside, just sick. I don't know where they are now. I lie down on the cot. It just gets sort of jumbled. I remember I thought it was almost like getting into the electric chair. And it goes off the back of the porch. And I know this is a dream because I'm flying. I'm flying, so this must be a dream. I don't want to see the last of that house, though. I don't. Where is the snow? We're out in the woods. Way the hell, they're all around me, and I'm naked, and I'm not cold. And they have a, there's like a swarm of them. They're around me. I feel very numb and funny. The next thing I know, I'm sitting. I'm still in this thing, but I am sitting in the woods. These people are scaring me terribly because, woof, right up, just shot right up. Yeah, that scared the dickens out of me. I saw the trees down there. Now they've got a floor under me again. You went up. I just shot right up out of the woods in this chair, this thing, more than a hundred feet. It was like going up in an elevator. I really felt it. And now they've got a floor under me. I'm sitting on a bench in a little room, and it smells funny. It's not clean in here. There is somebody talking to me. Now she walks right past in front, and she's wearing a tan suit. She looks like a little person made out of <laughs> leather, sort of. You know what? I think you are old. Are you old? She says, yes, I'm old. She's looking at me. She, she's got a matchbox. No, it's not a matchbox. In this exchange, she told me that an operation would be performed. What do you mean, an operation? 
I'm getting real scared again, real scared, because I cannot do a thing about this. I'm not going to let you do an operation on me. You have absolutely no right. We do have a right. That was it. Bang! There was nothing to it. I thought they were going to cut my whole head open. There was nothing to it. Dr. Klein asked, What happened? Just a bang back behind my head, that's all, I said. She's sitting right in front of me the whole time, just looking at me. They're moving around back there. They keep trying to put something in my mouth. They're real. They're real. Put up her cheek right to me, and they're real. What the hell did she say to me? You are the chosen one. Well, I don't believe that for a minute. It's ridiculous. I'm going to go home. That is where I belong. You just cut me on my finger, just like that. He comes up, pow, bang, dung. Doesn't hurt at all. I'm not scared the floor goes away like that. I... I'm rolling like a ball. Feels like I'm going backwards in a movie, almost. I went sailing right back into my living room in no more than a minute. I sit on the couch. I think I'm going to build up the fire, except I haven't got any clothes on. Oh, so cold, so tired. I go upstairs. There's two people standing up there now, and it scares me because I'm... I don't think they were there. I go in the bathroom, brush my teeth. I can't get that face out of my head. I'm sure glad to be home. Now I just have to go to bed. I see my dark pajamas, blue pajamas, put on my pajamas, get right into bed. I touch Anne, and she's warm. One thing you mentioned was this message that you were the chosen one, Dr. Klein said. Did they say chosen for what? No, not for anything. They've got a lot of them, believe me. I've seen some of the others before, all lying down there. What others? The other people. There's a whole row of them. Oh, but that was a long time ago. They didn't know where they were or what they were doing. I was sitting up in bed. How old were you? Twelve. Where were you? I was sitting up in bed, and everybody else was asleep. Oh, there's a whole bunch of beds. I'm sitting on a chair, just this grey thing in front of me. What is that? It's got red spots on it. I'm tired. I feel sick. Do you want to go home? I don't care if you never take me back home again. You have to go home. Who are all those people? Oh, they're all soldiers. What do you do to them? Oh, we look over them and send them home. Why do you look so awful? I can't help that. When did you find my sister? She, she's just down the hall. I then saw my father. He was standing up, apparently quite conscious. Daddy, don't be s so scared, Daddy. Come on, Daddy. Daddy, it's all right. He says, Witty, it's not all right. It's not all right. Oh, God, what is it? He asks. I don't know what it is either, Daddy. How'd you get up here, Daddy? I emerged spontaneously from hypnosis. We were on a train. Were we on a train? I was scared to death. Something had happened to my father. You talked about your sister, Bud Hopkins said. Yeah, my sister was there with us. How did I end up back in... I'm a little confused. I remember saying I'm 12 at some point, and then I remember seeing that thing again, the same thing I saw when... What was the thing? Bud asked. The thing is a... Well, I keep saying it's a woman, but it's a thing. But I saw her on the train. What in the world is all this about? Because I seem to remember seeing her on a train, but it's not a train. Your father was there? Yeah, he was there. He was scared to death. And when he got scared, I got scared. 
and there were a whole bunch of soldiers there too. Regular soldiers? And they had uniforms. They were all lying on tables. No, they were beds, but they were solid, no legs. You were allowed to sit up? I was sitting up, very excited. Then the next thing I knew, I saw my father, and I was terrified because he was so scared. I'm talking about memories that didn't happen on a train, obviously, am I not? Did I say it happened? I, I'm very confused here. I, I don't know what the hell's going on. What made you say train? I don't know. No, we were on a train. We, we were on a train, and I'll tell you the goddamnedest thing happened when we were on the train. We ended up in this thing when we were on a train. I'll tell you what we were doing, too. We were coming back from Madison, Wisconsin, on a train in the year 1957, and that's when it all happened. All of a sudden, I'm not on a train. I'm sitting up in bed, and all these soldiers... It wasn't an unpleasant place to be. I don't remember moving. That's the thing that's funny about it. I remember being in one place and then in another place. That's the damnedest thing. And when I saw my father, he was standing up and he looked totally bereft and terrified. I could hear him very faintly, just screaming and screaming. The second I heard it put just the terrifying fear into me. I, I remember that right sitting here, the, 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 the way that felt. Well, it just went right through me. When Daddy was scared, I was just scared to death. You said you took a trip. Yeah, the trip happened. And not only did the trip happen, something did happen on the trip, because on that trip, on the way back, I was sick as a dog, and my father was just having a hell of a time with me because I was so sick. There was something you were describing as if you'd seen it before. You know what I saw before? The woman. Yeah, the same person. That occurs in hypnosis, Dr. Klein explained. We have these spontaneous age shifts. Frequently, what will happen is that somebody will, under hypnosis, see something they've seen before or something like it, and the age shift will occur. What about this thing about the woman? Bud Hopkins asked. This is just so strange. We're going to have to talk about this another time because I just need to rest. When I left that last session, it was with a deep sense of concern. I felt that I was entering an unknown region of the mind, perhaps of experience. I was doubly worried now for my sanity. First, I still felt that I might be the victim of some rare disorder. Second, I questioned my ability to live with the notion that my whole life might have proceeded according to a hidden agenda. Neither of these alternatives was acceptable, hardly endurable, and yet one of them had to be true. I was a responsible husband and father. There wasn't any sign of psychosis in my personality. Don Klein was an acknowledged expert, and even after this hypnosis session, he told me he thought I was sane. But how could anyone not be psychotic and yet have these spectacular delusions? How could it be that this went back into my childhood? And if that wasn't true, and my mind had chosen to do this to itself, then what was it doing, and why? I wrestled with the notion that something might have been happening in my life, real encounters that were having a tremendous, hitherto unconscious effect on me. Certainly I had acted as if this were true before any conscious memories had emerged. 
The conscious memories didn't really come before the first week in January 1986, yet as early as the summer of 1985, I had become nervous about people in the house, even to the point of buying expensive burglar alarms and, in October, a shotgun. That night, I wished to God that I could somehow shed myself and step out fresh in the world. The visitors persisted in my mind like glowing coals. I could see those limitless, eternal eyes glaring right into the centre of me. I shut myself in my office and sat cross-legged on the floor, trying to collect myself. As soon as I relaxed, it was as if I had opened a hatch into another world. They swarmed at me, climbing out of my unconscious, grasping at me. This was not memory. It only worked through the medium of memory. It was meeting me on every level, caressing me as well as capturing me. This emergence was like a kind of internal birth. But what was being born was no bubbling infant. What came out into my conscious mind was a living, aware force. And I had a relationship with it, not a fluttering new one, but something rich and mature that ranged across the whole scale of emotions and included all of my time. I had to face it, whatever this was, it had been involved with me for years. I really squirmed. What might be hidden in the dark part of my mind? I thought then that I was dancing on the thinnest edge of my soul. To gain some semblance of control over myself, I decided to make an inventory of possibilities. I sat down at my desk and began to write. Even if the visitors were real, there was no reason to believe that they were simply creatures from another planet. I speculated. It could be that the visitors were really from here. Certainly the long tradition of fairy lore suggested that something had been with us for far more than the 40 or 50 years since the phenomenon took on its present appearance. Another thought was that the visitors might really be our own dead. Maybe we were a larval form and the adults of our species were as incomprehensible to us, as totally unimaginable, as the butterfly must be to the caterpillar. Perhaps the dead had been having their own technological revolution and were learning to break through the limits of their bourne. Or perhaps something very real had emerged from our own unconscious mind, taking actual physical form and coming forth to haunt us. Maybe belief creates its own reality. It could be that the gods of the past were strong because the belief of their followers actually did give them life, and maybe that was happening again. We were creating drab, post-industrial gods in the place of the glorious beings of the past, instead of Apollo riding his fiery chariot across the sky, or the goddess of night spreading her cloak of stars, we had created little steel-grey gods with the souls of pirates and craft no more beautiful inside than the bilges of battleships. Or maybe we were receiving a visit from another dimension, or even from another time. Maybe what we were seeing were human time travellers who assumed the disguise of extraterrestrial visitors in order to avoid creating some sort of catastrophic temporal paradox by revealing their presence to their own ancestors. I wondered about my description of them as insect-like. Their appearance was actually more humanoid. There were no feelers, no wings, no tangle of legs. It was the way they moved so stiffly that suggested the insect world to me. That and their enormous black eyes. If, say, some species of hive insect had become intelligent on some other planet, or even here, it might be very much older than us, 
and its mind very much more primitive in structure. They might have, in essence, a single, enormous mind. Such a mind might think very well indeed, but slowly. I had been assuming that any visitors would be vastly more intelligent than us. In terms of earthly evolution, man emerged only very recently. Maybe that also means that man is not the lesser creature, but the more advanced one. If this was so, then older, less quick-thinking and flexible forms might view us as quite a danger to them. And yet I did not have the feeling that they were hostile so much as stern. They were also, at least somewhat, frightened of me. In some sense, their emergence into human consciousness seemed to me to represent life or the universe itself engaged in some deep act of creation. It was pushing toward three o'clock in the morning and I was finally so exhausted that I could not stay awake. I went to bed. I do not remember my dreams. When morning came, it brought me only one thought. I had to see this through. I had to understand, as far as possible, what was happening to me. I wish that I could believe that the experience had never hurt anybody, but I couldn't believe that, not in view of the terrific stress I'd been under. Before I underwent hypnosis, the great and agonizing issue was, did it happen or not? In other words, was I a victim or a madman? This question was literally chewing up my soul. It was intolerable. Despite what they had done to me, I did not hate the visitors. Because I knew their strengths but not their motives, they frightened me. But I wished to be objective about them, even to the point of saying that they could very definitely be something from inside the mind, rather than from elsewhere in the universe. That they represented a real, living force seemed hard to dispute, but that this force might be essentially human in origin remained a definite possibility. Intellectually, I was unsure about what the visitors were, but my emotional self did not share that indecision. My emotional response was to real people, albeit non-human ones. I found myself thinking about the one I knew, turning her presence over and over in my mind. She had those amazing, electrifying eyes. They were featureless, in the sense that I could see neither pupil nor iris. There was a structure, perhaps of bones, faintly visible under the skin, and yet other parts of her body seemed almost like a sort of exoskeleton, like an insect would have. She was undeniably appealing to me. I bore toward her the same feelings of terror and fascination that I might toward someone I saw staring back at me from the depths of my unconscious. There was in her gaze an element that is so absolutely implacable that I had other feelings about her too. In her presence, I had no personal freedom at all. I could not speak, could not move as I wished. I wondered if it was the sheer impact of the experience that had fixed the image of this being so vividly in my mind, or had communion somehow come alive within me. How odd it was to find oneself suddenly under the very power that one so easily assumes over the animals. I had been captured like a wild animal on December the 26th, rendered helpless and dragged out of my den into the night. Later, I thought to myself that they were taming me. Nobody has ever domesticated mankind. We are thus a wild species, as wild as the day we first went howling across the savannah. Perhaps the self-taming process of becoming a civilized species did not tame us to visitors, but only to ourselves. And then, not very well, given our violent history, I reflected that the abduction to a round room had a long, long tradition in our culture. There were many such cases in fairy lore. Maybe the fairy 
was a real species, for example. Perhaps they now floated around in unidentified flying objects and wielded insight-producing wands because they have enjoyed their own technological revolution. Every time one decides either that this is psychological or real, one soon finds a theory that forcefully reopens the case in favour of the opposite notion. The most difficult part of my hypnotic material was this sudden regression to 1957. How could I explain that, even in the terms of visitors? To do so, I had to revise my whole understanding of what my life had been. I was deeply upset by that unexpected regression. But it was no more than a mild state of unease compared to how I felt after I had made a careful inventory of my past. The more I thought about it, the less able I was to accept the idea that this had been happening to me most of my life. When Bud Hopkins asked me if I remembered anything in the past, I did mention a few odd incidents. Uh, the memory of being taken from the train was not among them. If I accepted that this happened and that it was buried even more completely than the events of October the 4th, then what else must I accept? Inevitably, that my conscious life was nothing more than a disguise for another reality. As an experiment, I decided to return to my past and see just what I could come up with. Maybe nothing happened on that train. It seemed like a trick of the mind. Then I remembered that hypnosis session, and I thought to myself that the real trick of the mind might be happening now. My memories were so spontaneous, and it seemed so vividly real. I remember that a row of soldiers sleeping on those tables just as well as I remembered the drawing room of the train we were on. In July 1957, my father took my sister, who was then 13, and myself from San Antonio to Madison, Wisconsin, to see his sister and her family. A week later, we returned to San Antonio on the train. All my life, I've had a memory of that train seen from above, rushing through the night. Most of the windows are dark, which suggests that it is very late. There are thick pine woods, meaning that it must have been in Arkansas or farther north, for the Texas Eagle did not go through the pine forests of East Texas, but rather across the plains between Texarkana and Dallas, and then south over rolling, featureless country. For some reason, I had never thought twice about the strange image of the speeding train. Why should I have seen it from such a position? Can it be that I really was outside of it at some point? I remember absolutely nothing about being taken off the train. There was some sort of confused recollection of my father crouched at the back of an upper berth in our drawing room, his eyes bulging and his lips twisted back from his teeth. Uh, but I've always assumed that that was a nightmare brought on by the fact that I was so sick on the trip. I have not thought about those hours of sickness on that train for a long, long time. The illness had begun suddenly in the middle of the night and continued until morning. I was sleeping like the dead when the train finally pulled into the old Mopac station in San Antonio. My father carried me to a cab, and we went home. By the time I got there, I was feeling much better and was eager to see my friends. No sooner had I gone through the motions of helping with the luggage than I was off, my sickness forgotten. I remember it was then that I told a story which has remained in the back of my mind for years, of hearing a wolf howling and seeing one on the roadside. Even as I told the story, I remember being a little confused. Since then, it has lingered the image of the wolf in the clearing and the sound of its voice echoing through the night. I knew, even as I spoke, that we hadn't really seen a wolf or heard one howl. Why, then, was I saying it? Where had it come from? Was it one of the screen memories which was so common to experiences with the visitors? My memory of the December the 26th incident 
was at first blocked by their recollection of the owl. My life is full of peculiar stories like the one about the wolf. Many of my screen memories concern animals, but not all. I remember being terrified as a little boy by an appearance of Mr. Peanut. And yet, I know, I never saw Mr. Peanut except on a planter's can. What is behind the screen memories? Perhaps on some level I do know. Maybe that's why I spent so much time peeking into closets and under beds. If I really face the truth about this behavior, I must admit that it has been going on for a long time, although in 1985 it became much more intense. Now that I have uncovered these memories, though, it has ended completely. What had my life really been? And how many other lives have been lived like mine, skidding the surface of this dark mirror? I wondered in early 1986 if a couple of recent strange events might have some relevance to this inquiry into the past. During the third week of March, I had a very peculiar thing happen to me. Sometime in the night of March the 21st at the cabin, I awoke and found myself unable to move or even to open my eyes. I had the distinct impression that there was something in my left nostril and that it was being slowly moved far up my nose. When I tried to struggle, I heard a pop, like an apple crunching between my eyes. The next thing I remembered, it was morning. I noticed during the day that my nose hurt. There was a little bleeding, but as my wife and son had reported similar injuries without the memory of something being in their noses the week before, I assumed that this was the result of a head cold and dry winter air. But I never came down with a cold. I thought no more about this until July the 26th, 1986, when I received a letter from Donald Klein in which he mentioned that many of my symptoms were consistent with an abnormality in the temporal lobe and that the method of testing this involved a nasal probe. The temporal lobe is arguably the most important part of the brain, the seat of humanity itself. It is in the temporal lobe that sense is made out of perceptions. People with temporal lobe epilepsy report déjà vu, unexplained panic states, strong smells, and even a preoccupation with philosophical and cosmic concerns. They also sometimes report vivid hallucinatory journeys. Initially, I seized on this as a way to explain my whole experience. But the more I studied temporal lobe disorder, the less it seemed an answer. It did not explain the overwhelming sense of the real connected with my experiences. It did not explain the physical consequences. It did not explain the witnesses. Temporal lobe epilepsy was nothing more than another speculation, essentially no different and no more supportable than the visitor hypothesis or any of the other hypotheses that I had put forward. I decided that I would arrange two separate temporal lobe tests, one by a neurologist recommended by Dr. Klein and another through a different psychiatrist. This second neurologist carried out the same preliminary examination done by Dr. Klein's man and came to the same conclusion. There was no evidence of abnormality. I went to a lab, took chloral hydrate and endured the insertion of electrodes deep into my nasal cavity. A few days later, the results came back. Absolutely normal temporal lobe function confirmed by both neurologists. There was one incident that is worth recounting because it was this incident more than any other that opened the door to the past. The night of Friday, February the 7th, we spent in our apartment in the city. I was absolutely frantic. I had an awful feeling. I felt their presence. It was palpable. Most upsetting, I could smell them. I could smell a distinct odor as if of smoldering cardboard. 
and it was familiar from the past. My wife could also smell this odour. It was one we had both smelled many times. There was also another odour, as if of cheese and cinnamon, that I remembered from December the 26th. I remained lying in bed, sweaty and sleepless. I was shocked to discover that four hours had passed without my noticing, very suddenly. I was reading at midnight, turned a page, and saw by the clock it was 4 a.m., and I was no longer wearing my pyjamas. When I got up the next morning, I found two little triangles inscribed on my left forearm. I don't know what happened, and there was no way at all to explain the event in a conventional manner. The larger triangle was quite straight, delicately incised, in just the outer few skin layers, as if by the work of a skilled master surgeon. The other triangle, very tiny, was pointing at the larger one. On the morning of February the 8th, I stood looking down at those triangles with a shower pounding on my back. I also remembered the odours I had smelled the night before. Odour is an excellent trigger of memory, and the odour of smouldering seemed to unlock a lot of doors. I last smelled it in 1972 or 1973. My wife and I had gone down to San Antonio to see my family, and we were sleeping in my sister's old bedroom on the second floor of the house. In the middle of the night, I suddenly awoke with the impression that I had just heard a loud noise. I decided to get a glass of water. As I left our bedroom, I noticed a strange smell, like smouldering cardboard. As I went toward the bathroom to get my water, a small, dark figure with a red light in its hand burst out of my old bedroom and dashed downstairs. I was momentarily astonished, but decided that it must have been a family member. The fact that this individual was much smaller than a human being did not bother me in the least, nor even give me pause. Why not? Maybe for the same reason that none of us remembered the events of the night of October the 4th. I searched on, deep into my past. At the age of nine, I had been sleeping out with a friend on a lovely Texas summer night when something woke us up in the wee hours, perhaps an owl killing a rat, the stopping of the crickets or moonset. In any case, we found ourselves awake and deliciously alone in the dark. We went exploring the quiet slips of the night. The vacant lot behind our house was then an acre of tall sunflowers, taller than either of us boys. We were wandering through these stalks when we heard someone coming toward us. My friend turned and ran. I stood there, then turned and ran as well. When I reached our sleeping bags, I was astonished to find him already so completely asleep that I could not wake him up. How could he have gone from running in terror to being dead to the world like that? Why hadn't he gone running into the house? He and I also saw a huge object cross the sky one summer night, an event I have always remembered as particularly strange. I called him. After a lapse of twenty-five years, we talked for some time, and then I asked him about those two nights. I told him nothing specific about my other experiences, nor did I discuss visitors. Of the first memory, he said, We were probably just scared by a dog. He had this to say about the second. Oh, yes, I remember that thing. It was huge. It looked just like... Well, it was strange looking. And there was a black car. Now, I remembered that too. Immediately after the object passed overhead, an old black car showing no lights went racing down the road in the same direction that the object had gone. From the night at age nine to the event in Austin in September 1967, there were few specific recollections except those that emerged under hypnosis, and none was clear. By 1967, I was attending the University of Texas. In the last week of August, 
I had just rented a new studio apartment and moved back to Austin from San Antonio for the semester when I had an experience I now understand to have been what is known as a missing time experience, lasting at least 24 hours. I had moved into the apartment the day before and was sitting on the couch about noon, eating a TV dinner, when I was confused to discover that the dinner seemed to have hopped from my lap onto the coffee table and gone cold. I remember getting up to reheat the food and noticing that it was already 2 p.m. I decided I had fallen asleep while eating. I put the TV dinner in the oven and turned on the timer to heat it for 15 minutes. Then I turned back to the oven to check the temperature setting. I was suddenly woozy, my mouth dry, and the sun was going down outside. The dinner was cold again, and I had and have no memory of how the intervening hours had passed. I got scared, deciding that I had been the victim of blackouts and I tried to make a phone call for help. It was midnight by the oven clock when I put my hand on the phone. It was exactly as if six hours had somehow passed in less than a second. I then began trying to make my way out of the dark apartment. I was terrified. I shook with fear and was so thirsty I could barely stand it. The next thing I knew, I was in front of the sink. The water was running and running into a full glass. My watch said 4.15. I rushed out of the door of the apartment and found myself in the cool of a Texas pre-dawn. At this point, I remembered something of awesome beauty taking place in the sky, which I later told my friends must have been a display of the Perseid meteor shower, which was not active then, but had been early in August. I drove to an all-night restaurant and had a huge breakfast and at least six glasses of orange juice. Some weeks later, there was a frightening sequel. I was lying in bed at my grandmother's house in San Antonio reading Time magazine. I was suddenly transported back in time and back to Austin a few weeks earlier. I leaped into my car and backed out of the apartment house parking lot. It was night and the windows of the car were closed. I couldn't see out at all. In fact, I could see nothing but the reflection of the inside of the car. I was so blind that I was forced to stop. Something approached the car. I was frightened to see, peering in the window, with its face pressed almost to the glass, what seemed almost to be a demon with a narrow face and dark, slanted eyes. It spoke to me in a high, squeaky voice, and I remember saying that we couldn't leave the car out in the middle of the street. Then I found myself in an agonizing struggle. I was at once in the car fighting to keep driving away but unable to overcome an urge to get out and go back into the apartment, while simultaneously fighting in the real world an overwhelming urge to get out of bed and rush outside. Then it ended. The magazine was still propped up on my lap. This terrible nightmare had obviously caused not a stir. I believe now that this was a nightmare memory of an attempt I made to escape whatever unearthly thing happened to me in my apartment in Austin. I was reliving an experience which, at the time it happened, was so unspeakably terrifying that I still don't recall the actual event, only the dream. Then began a pattern of running that has persisted in my life until the present. A few weeks later, I suddenly became obsessed with the notion of getting away from the University of Texas, out of the United States, of going wherever I could, as far away as possible. I obtained a loan to study film at the London School of Film Technique. By January 1968, I had saved enough money and left for London. My first few months in London were bliss. Then, in July, there was another incident. I was at a friend's flat in the King's Road, Chelsea. For years, I have described it as a raid from which I escaped by crossing the roofs. 
What I actually remember is a period of complete perceptual chaos, followed by the confusing sensation of looking down into the chimney pots of buildings. Then there was blackness. I woke up the next morning in my own place with no idea of how I got there. The next day, I decided to leave London for the continent. I couldn't stand England for another week, not another hour. I took the train to Italy, second class. On the train, I met a young woman, and we began to travel together. At this point, my memories become extremely odd. I recall that we went to Rome, but that we spent a few days in Florence on the way. For some reason, I left the young woman in Rome and dashed off on the train with no ticket, traveling almost at random. I ended up in Strasbourg, where I saw the cathedral, then suddenly rushed to the station and grabbed another train, a local, that crept across France, ending at Port Bou on the Spanish border. There I took a Spanish train to Barcelona. I was broke, so I holed up in a back room in a hotel on the Ramblas. I can remember nights of terror, being afraid to put out the light, or wanting to keep the window and door locked. The rest of the memory is a jumbled mess, I am just not certain what happened, except that I lost weeks of time. I returned to London in an odd way weeks later than I had planned, with no way to explain those weeks. If such incidents were a frequent occurrence in my life, I might suspect some sort of trance or fugue state. There are certainly many odd incidents, but they are too variable in their nature to suggest the symptomatic consistency of disease. In January of 1980, Anne and I took an apartment on the top floor of a high-rise on East 75th Street. All went well until September of that year. This episode began when I saw a strange light streak down the night sky. It moved faster than an airplane and left me with the feeling that it had something to do with me. I was deeply and inexplicably moved, and left with an obscure foreboding. In the middle of the night we were awakened by our son's crying. He was desperate, almost wild with terror. I rushed into the living room, heading for his bedroom. I recall the impression of a small, dark figure dashing toward the sliding doors that led to our thirty-third floor balcony. Then there was a terrific explosion, and the beads of glass burst out of the pantry. I kept running for my terrified baby, reaching his crib after what seemed an eternity. I cradled him in my arms while Anne rushed through the house, turning on lights. Then she took our son, and I went to see what on earth had happened. A siphon of seltzer had exploded so violently that the glass was reduced to beads, to dust. There wasn't a trace of the water that had been inside. Anne cleaned up the mess while I calmed our son. Then we went back to bed. In November, we closed on a co-op and by January 1981 had moved again, this time to our present apartment in the village. A year passed in the village, quite pleasantly and uneventfully. Then came what we called the incident of the white thing. One night, Anne woke up screaming and reported that something had poked her in the stomach. She had seen it, too. It was translucent white at about three feet tall. She was greatly agitated. Naturally, we took this to be a nightmare. Nothing more was said about it. Certainly, nothing was said to our son. The next night, at about ten, I was sitting up and reading. Anne had just turned over to go to sleep. Suddenly, I was struck on the arm. As I turned, I saw a small, pale shape withdrawing into the hall. I jumped up and followed it, only to find the hall empty. It hadn't been our son. He was peacefully asleep in bed. A few nights later, our son suddenly began screaming the house down. I leaped out of bed and went to him. He was terribly frightened. He said that a little white thing had come up to his bed and poked me and poked me. Neither Anne nor our son showed any physical evidence of injury. Once we reviewed this apparent past material, Don Klein and I decided to go fishing in it. 
we decided to cover the night at my grandmother's house, the fall of 1980 in New York, and anything else that might be of interest. This time, we tried for a very, very deep trance. We went first to the incident at my grandmother's house in 1967. The images were startlingly real, almost as vivid as if I were there again 20 years ago. Granny's in the other room, I began. She's reading, too. I see her light is still on. The rest of the house is dark. I turn a page. There's an ad for a car. Just staring at the ad. God damn, something's buzzing around in here. I'm fighting it. All of a sudden, it puts something on my head like a railroad spike. A silver nail. And I turn into something else. I'm heavy and big. I get up out of bed. I feel totally different. I feel like I'm moving, like I'm walking through the house, like I'm a ghost in the house. No, I'm not. I'm still in bed. Oh, it's so peculiar. Because I never moved at all, I get up and get a glass of water. I'm scared to death. I don't know why this happened to me. Uh, try and relax now. Relax, Dr. Klein said. We talked about another time where you thought you saw a meteorite? Yeah. How old are you now? I'm 36. Tell me what happened. I'm working very hard on my new book. I feel pretty good about it. And looking out over the city one night, the sun had just set and it was beautiful orange glow. You could see the street lights everywhere. I love that den I had then. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful of you. When it's clear, I can see all the way up to Bear Mountain. And then I saw this meteor. It came down out of the sky, very tiny, like a spark, oh, and I felt awed. Like it was someone coming to see me, I told Anne about it. And I went to bed. I love her so much. You know, I can't believe I'm seeing this. One, two, three, four, five, six. I look up from my book and there are six figures standing at the end of the bed looking right at both of us. She's turned over and she's asleep. I say, Anne, Anne, look at this. They're menacing looking. I don't understand where... They even could have come from. They make no sound. I feel like I've just gotten some kind of weight on me. I want to get up. I'm thinking about my son. I do not know what's going on in here. They're just standing there. They don't sing anything. They don't even look like they're alive. Now, am I seeing things? I close my eyes. I open my eyes. And it's changed. Now they're around both sides of the bed, about halfway up. Like when you stop looking at them, they start moving. Oh, I've lost my mind. I have lost my mind. This cannot be real. Anne. Anne. I shake Anne. I don't stop looking at them. They're wearing uniforms. Why in the world won't Anne wake up? It's like I'm in another world. Oh, this is a really foul nightmare. Who's that standing out there? I get the feeling this place is full of people. Our boy says, oh, and he screams out loud, real loud. They pull all right down to the foot of the bed, and I get up and I'm running like hell, and he's screaming like hell, and that praying mantis is standing right in the middle of the living room. I run on into my boy, and he's put his arms out, and I never saw that little boy scream like that before. Anne! What the hell was that? I pick him up. She comes in. We're holding him. Both of us are holding him. He finally calms down. What happened, Anne? My God, something blew up in the kitchen. A bottle of seltzer blew up. I've still got my son. 
I, I walk out there. She's out there working on the glass, and I'm rocking him. We've got all the lights on. I'm rocking him. Don then brought me out of the trance. I was shocked by the unqualified reality of what I had seen. I could just not believe in that moment that the forms persisting in my mind were anything but real. And yet, they had to be something else. Surely they did. The morning after the hypnotic session, I awoke not only feeling as if I had been beaten up during the night, I was aware of something new in my mind. At first, the exact nature of this new manifestation was not clear to me. I was oppressed by it. There was an acute impression of being watched. Then I began to realize why I was being watched. There was a face staring directly at me, the grave, implacable, subtly humorous face I had come to recognize from hypnosis. A vivid image of here had emerged in my mind. It was so real I could almost touch it. I think that the image was somehow triggered by hypnosis. Maybe the intense state of concentration evoked it from my unconscious, or maybe I attracted the visitor's attention and they responded. I felt a strong sense of relationship. Looking at it was more like looking at a person behind soundproof glass than looking at a picture. As I watched, the image moved its nose, revealing that this was obviously a sensitive organ, both of touch and smell. The mouth was not straight, but rather one of those rich and complex lines that come to a human mouth with the advance of years. Centered in this mouth was a remarkable expression. The outcome, it seemed to me, of implacable will, leavened by what I can only describe as mirth. There were no lips at all. The chin was strong, very pointed, and there was a general impression that the skin was stretched over a plated bone structure. By far the most arresting feature in this face was the eyes. They were far larger than our own eyes. In them, I once or twice glimpsed a suggestion of black iris and pupil, uh, but it was no more than a suggestion as if there were optic structures of some kind floating behind those wells of darkness. It was those eyes that I saw staring down at me on October the 4th, those eyes that gleamed so furiously in the faint night light. I remembered them from December 26th too, and from the summer of 1957. While the image stayed with me, it remained exactly the same as it was when I first saw it. On March 13th, I made a complete physical description on tape. On March 23rd, I would repeat the description again, then compare the two tapes. There was no difference. Late on the night of March 14th, after I'd come back from the hypnosis session covering events in our apartment on East 75th Street, I sat down once again to think things through. The image was with me, of course. I wondered what would happen if I asked it to come to me. I sat there, looking at it. It looked back at me. Nothing more happened. The thought flashed through my mind, almost unbidden, uh, that anything I wrote about this experience would be far more intense if I was given some sort of confirmation. The image responded with a sharper stare. On Saturday morning, we went to the country. Our son had invited a friend, and we picked this child up on the way. She was one of his school friends, also seven, and the two of them were full of excitement about their weekend together. Before dinner, I took a walk along our quiet, private road. On the walk, I saw a hair-thin streak of light come straight down out of the sky. I thought, I'm disappointed in myself, or in them. 
Why such a dismal little manifestation? It was dark when the four of us sat down to the dinner table. We had been eating for only a few minutes when our son's guest suddenly shouted, A little airplane covered with lights just flew through the front yard. There was real shock in this kid's face. The child looked at me, obviously distressed. My impulse was to hide under the table, but I pulled myself together and managed instead to speak in an offhand and reassuring manner. There's an air base near here, I said. The National Guard base is 30 miles away, but it was all I could think to say. Oh, we don't let these things bother us. Best to just forget about it. I got up and went outside, but saw nothing. Soon the shock subsided and the children went on eating. After dinner... Anne and I went upstairs and discussed the matter. Frankly, the kid's observation, coming as it did at that moment, had convinced me that on some level what was happening must be real. Why else would the child have made that announcement? Not a word about the visitors had been said within earshot of either of the kids, and the little girl was absolutely without information on the subject. Maybe the child really saw an object in the physical world, but maybe, also, the mind has powers that we do not understand. Perhaps there is such a thing as mental telepathy. And when I asked the image to help me, what I really did was to send my own inner self on a quest. And at the end of its quest, it found this innocent, open little mind, entered it, and there created an hallucination, knowing full well that the little guest would be the last person at the house likely to see anything, and thus the first one to be believed. By nine, both children were fast asleep. I was in a surprisingly benign mood, listening to music on WAMC out of Albany and enjoying being with my wife. We sat together in the parlour in our big upstairs bedroom and got sleepier and sleepier. By the time the clock rang ten, it was all we could do to crawl into bed. We went to sleep. Sometime during the night, I was awakened abruptly by a jab on my shoulder. I came to full consciousness instantly. There were three small people standing beside the bed, their outlines clearly visible in the glow of the burglar alarm panel. They were wearing blue coveralls and standing absolutely still. They were familiar figures, not the fierce huge-eyed feminine being I have described before, but rather the more dwarf-like ones, stocky and solidly built with grey humanoid faces and glittering deep-set eyes. They were the ones I felt were the good army when they took me on December 26th. I thought to myself, my God, I'm completely conscious and they're just standing there. <laughs> I thought that I could turn on the light, perhaps even get out of bed, then I tried to move my hand, thinking to flip the switch on my bedside lamp and see the time. I can only describe the sensation I felt when I tried to move as like pushing my arm through electrified tar. It took every ounce of attention I possessed to get any movement at all. I turned my head, fighting a pressure that felt as if a sheath of lead had been draped over me and saw the light switch in the dark. I watched my hand move slowly closer and finally felt the switch under my finger. I clicked it. Nothing. Tried again. Still nothing. The electricity was off. The burglar alarm was still working because it had battery backup, but apparently it meant little to them as they had entered the house without tripping it. When I turned my head back, I confronted a sight so weird I thought afterwards that I did not know how to write about it. Beside my bed, perhaps two feet from my face, close enough to see it plainly without my glasses, was a version of the thin ones, the type I have called her. It was not quite right, though. Its eyes were like big black buttons, round rather than slanted. It appeared to be wearing an inept cardboard imitation of a blue double-breasted suit, complete with a white triangle of handkerchiefs sticking out of the pocket. I was overcome at this point by terror so fierce and physical that it seemed more biological than physiological. 
What was I going to do, having called them, lie here and quake? I had wanted to communicate. I wanted them to know I was still in possession of myself, that despite what I can only describe as a terrific assault against me, physically and mentally, I was still functional, and on some level, independent. Lying in that bed, I felt a very strong sense of responsibility. I had to communicate in some non-threatening manner. I was an emissary of sorts, although perhaps only to the court of nightmare. Again, it took an absolute concentration of will, a centering of my attention, and the application of the most careful effort to the muscles of my face, but I did manage to smile. Instantly, everything changed. They dashed away with a whoosh, and I was plunged almost at once back into sleep. What happened the night of March 15th was fundamentally different and more open than any other contact I have had. The visitors almost irrefutably announced themselves to me. They allowed me to see them while in full possession of my other memories of them, albeit in a more or less completely restrained physical condition. And they preceded their appearance to me by the witness of the uninvolved child, the one person there that night who had absolutely no relationship to this at all. Who had come to see me during the night? Did they really drop down from the sky? Or have they come from some other cosmos, a place where dreams are real, and reality a dream, where shadows and those who cast them are one and the same? My impression is that these people, if they exist, are more than a little afraid of us. They are deeply afraid. I suppose it was best to smile rather than move my hands toward them, but I wish that there had been touch. Could there have been? Or would my fingers have crossed only air? I suppose that I would always wonder. I asked for confirmation, not proof. It seems that they took me at the exact meaning of the word. From the beginning, I had been disturbed that my wife and son might have been involved in this. At least, they had suffered with me through my upheavals. At the worst, they were as entangled as I am. Our son has been preserved from almost all conversation about it and from direct experience of my personal trauma. When Anne was first hypnotized to aid her in recalling the nights of October the 4th and December 26th, she was aware only that something very unusual seemed to have happened on those dates. I did not keep it all from her out of some desire to preserve her the purity of hypnotic recall. I kept it from her because there was a possibility, however remote, that visitors had been around us in the night. Thus... The visitor hypothesis had been discussed by us only in general terms. Only after her first hypnosis, which took place on March 13th, 1986, did I indicate that I felt there might have been some non-human presence involved in our lives. Before hypnosis, Anne had a vague memory of me warning her of fire on the night of October the 4th, of hearing an explosion and our son calling out to me. She had no memories at all of the night of December the 26th. On March the 13th, 1986, Anne was hypnotized by Dr. Robert Nyman. We chose a psychiatrist other than Don Klein so that there could be no possibility of his questions taking on some sort of unnoticed direction because of what he already knew. Anne and I are a very deep, total marriage. If something was really happening to me, then she had to know. She would have some involvement. If she had reported nothing, then to me it would have indicated that mine was an essentially psychological experience, perhaps shared in some unusual ways, but essentially psychological. Despite all the progress that I had made in dealing with this experience, I must admit that Anne's hypnosis disturbed me 
all over again. Her hypnosis does not reveal a person trying to concoct a story, but rather one trying hard to avoid remembering something she had been told in the strongest terms to forget. She was compliant, all right, but not with the hypnotist. She complied, it appears, with something else that issued previous stronger suggestions. My wife appears to have been made to believe that my mental health depends on her not remembering, on her providing me with a safe haven in ordinary reality when I need one. Let's go to the night of October the 4th, Dr. Nyman began, when Anne was under hypnosis. You and Whitley were there, and your son was there, and you had guests, Jacques and Annie. You've said good night to your guests, and your son is already asleep. You and Whitley went upstairs. Yeah, Anne said. Just give me, to the best of your recollection, what happened that night, concentrating as hard as you can. It wasn't a peaceful night, but I don't remember why. It seems like there was a lot going on. I, uh, I remember Whitley thought the roof was on fire. I don't remember that. Uh, but I remember it was like a culmination of a lot of other activity. I don't... Uh, I, I don't. It seems like it was late and not dark, but I don't remember that, and it's not clear. I get the feeling that Whitley was up all night, and it was this thing and that thing, and finally it was the roof. It was something else other than the roof on fire. What's going through your mind now? Nothing. Nothing? Concentrate hard. I just see a light. I mean, it's not dark. It's just that I have my eyes closed, and it's not dark. It's light. Whitley woke me up, and he thought the roof was on fire. If the roof's on fire, you'd see the roof all lit up. He saw a light that I didn't see. Is it possible that you didn't open your eyes? Yeah. Yet you do make some references to a light that night. Oh, that feeling is gone now. Uh, but I don't remember it as a restful night. You know uh, Bud Hopkins is here, of course, and uh, you don't mind if he asks you some questions? Bud asked, Did you have any dreams that night? Don't remember, Annie said. You said that it had been a restless night because of dreams? Let me think. I don't think Whitley was there very much. He was gone. You, you know, he goes sometimes at night. He goes and works. Or he just goes. You have an impression of Whit being away from the bed? Yes. Was it after he said the roof's on fire? I think it was before, too. He was just doing things all night. Did you hear your son? Yes, he sounded so frightened. He gets nightmares sometimes, but he sounded... Especially frightened, more frightened than usual. It, did he say words? Well, he did, but I don't remember what they were. Oh, something really scared him. I thought somebody was doing something to him. Why didn't you go to him? Because Whitley was already on his way. But I remember feeling very uneasy. I wanted to go too, but I felt I shouldn't. Why not? I thought there was something Whitley would... It had to do with him. He was supposed to go. He was supposed to go? Yeah, he was supposed to go. Oh, it must have been difficult staying in bed. It was, because I wondered what had happened. Was there something going on in the room, or did Jacques and Annie... No, they weren't in on it. There was something going on. I wanted to know what was going on. There were lots of things going on, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Why didn't you get up and go see? I couldn't, because I wouldn't. I was afraid to, or I wasn't supposed to. It was like your mother said to you, you have to stay here. 
even if you don't. You're dying to get out and go and see what's going on, uh, but you know because you've been told. Uh, who told you that? Nobody told me. I just had to do it. Have an impulse to turn on the light. Oh, no, I, I, no, I wasn't supposed to see. Anne, I want you to do me a favor, Bud said. I want you to have a little dream, a fantasy, about what all that activity was. What's happening? Whitley's supposed to go. They came for Whitley. I'm sorry. They came for Whitley, and he's supposed to go, but I'm not supposed to go. Who came? Nobody that I know of. He just has a feeling that he's supposed to. What was restraining you from going to your son? Oh, I didn't feel restrained. I just felt like I wasn't supposed to go. Uh, what about the bag? Maybe that's why it seemed so active that night. Maybe it was noisy. What kind of noises? Just our son. I get the impression... It wasn't a quiet night. I get the impression that someone was there, but it wasn't Jacques and Annie, because they were in their room and they stayed in their room, but... And then I remember Annie comforting our boy. Uh, it, it was a woman. I thought it was Annie. It was Annie. You, you recognized her voice? I think I did. Uh, but I get the vague impression that they were in there like a cocoon, locked in that room. Jacques and Annie? Yeah. It's like they couldn't get out, you know. I want you to jump ahead to December the 26th of 1985, what you remember of that day as you concentrate very hard. I remember the owl. I remember Whitley talking about a crystal, too. About a what? A crystal in the sky. But that was before the owl. Did you see it? Oh, no. Why do you say, oh, no, as if... Oh, Whitley saw a lot of things that I didn't see at that time. Did you look for it? Oh, no, because I knew it wasn't real. How did you know it wasn't real? Whitley's a fairly down-to-earth guy. Oh, no, he isn't. He's not? No, because there couldn't be a crystal in the sky. You think Whitley should go to a psychiatrist? No, because he... Well, I think he can deal with these problems. Back to that night... It was so restless. It was like a party. It was like a party and not being invited. What kind of party was it? Well, you know, Jacques and Annie weren't invited either. It was all going on downstairs, and I had to wait for them to come back. It was like your mother says, no, you can't go. Do you think that feeling may have ever happened to you before? Well, I've often felt that there are things going on with Whitley that I wasn't supposed to know. I'm supposed to kind of help him afterwards to deal with it. That's my role. But I can't stop them, you know. He just has to. Do you think that these are things that come out of Whitley's head? No. I don't think he has hallucinations. No. Uh, but I think they come to him because of his head. He has a very unique head. Annie, I'd like to ask you, there was a night on LaGuardia Place uh, that something thumped you? Oh, the white thing. You have a sense of what that was? Oh, yes, like a sharp jab in the stomach. It was like four fingers, n not just one finger. It was like a joke. But then who would do that? And once, and disappear, you know, woke me right up. Did you open your eyes? No, I don't think so, but I sat up. It woke me up. My son woke up and had a nightmare at the same time and said something poked him in the stomach. And then Whitley, he said something poked him in the stomach. He said he saw a little white thing. I listened to the recording of Anne's first hypnosis on March the 17th, 1986, the Monday after the confirming encounter in the country. I asked her, What do you mean, Whitley's supposed to go? Well, that's what I said. 
Do you see me go? No, but I hear it. There's a lot of noise sometimes. I keep my eyes closed. But don't you worry. No. You're always there in the morning. Anne's testimony had a powerful effect on me. Hers was probably the most remarkable element yet to be introduced into this account. This was because there seemed to be so much unconscious process implied by her testimony. It really did appear that she had performed a function she had been trained to do. And there was that enigmatic female presence. In my own hypnosis, I remembered it making some sort of noises to me when it was beside the bed on the night of October 4th. I was disappearing into the night. I had remembered probes going into my brain. My wife had painted a picture of me as a sort of soldier of the night, vulnerable and helpless. One could state a few things with certainty, if one was careful. Something had happened to me and possibly to my son. Its source and nature were unknown, but there was a strong suggestion that it included some sort of physical component external to and independent of us. Another thing that could be stated was that my wife had been aware that something was happening, and she responded by preserving her own neutrality. Maybe she had been trained to do this, and maybe not. It could also be that she was doing it out of an instinct to help her husband. The support she had provided may have been her own invention rather than the outcome of training or suggestion from the visitors. While Anne's hidden role seemed to be that of passive supporter, her own life role is very different. It was clearly revealed by a statement she made before the second session when Dr. Nyman asked her if her presence in his office was voluntary. If I had said, no, I'm not going through with this, I wouldn't be here. She is as independent a person as I know, a committed feminist who is politically and socially as active as she cares to be. Except when it comes to this. In this matter, she is passive, which is in itself awfully strange. As the intensity of the experience built, Anne became uneasy with her role. Things were going on, and I wanted to know what was going on. Her tone became forceful, almost angry. When asked why she didn't simply go and see, she repeated that she wasn't supposed to. Supporting this came the first of a number of what she feels are references to a female authority. It was like your mother said to you, you have to stay here. Anne's hypnosis strongly suggested that I'm taken all the time. When she was being hypnotized, Anne had no idea at all that I remembered more than two occasions when something strange happened. She said frankly that she did not consider me a down-to-earth guy. I'm glad of that. After all that appears to have been happening, she would have to be incredibly imperceptive to think that I was down to earth. Dr. Nyman uh, quite naturally asked her if she thought I should go to a psychiatrist. Her reply was interesting. No, because he... I think he can deal with these problems. What? I'm seeing things, and my practical, no-nonsense wife doesn't think I should see a psychiatrist... Perhaps she knew that there would be no point, because on the level she would not directly address, she was aware that these are the side effects of real experience. I've asked my son to describe any strange dreams he recalls. He has never been hypnotized, and he won't be until he can decide for himself if he wishes to do it. No matter what the source, this material can be very disturbing indeed under hypnosis and it is certainly not the business of a parent to assault a child's mind by such experimentation. Here are some of my son's dreams in his own words. 
Well, I was dreaming that I was on a boat with my friend Ezra, and we were about to dive off, and I was in the middle of the air when I switched to this dream where I was in the hospital in the future, where they were trying to cure some kind of disease. And I was taken out of my bed and onto a cot and out on the porch. Who took you out of your bed onto the cot? Some kind of doctor. What did he look like? Oh, he was a very short and fat man with glasses that came out pointed upward. And he always has a big fake smile on him. Did you see him when he wasn't smiling? Yeah. Well, when he was doing the operation on me. What kind of operation? It was a disease on my arm. He did something to your arm? No, wait, he kept your nose cold like when you eat a lot of ice cream. You say you were examined on the porch. What do you mean by that? Well, they took me out onto the porch. There was no way to get me into an operation room because of all the moving equipment. They took special lights and examined my nose and took x-rays and stuff. Ever remember a dream where a monster came in the house and Mommy fainted? What's that from? Oh, that's one of my journal stories. Yeah, uh, why'd you make that one up for your journal? I don't know. It was a free journal story period, and I couldn't think of anything. I was tossing and turning in my desk trying to think of something, and then suddenly that dream just popped into my head. What was it like, that dream? It was in a cornfield, my mommy and me, and I was chewing on this piece of corn, and my mom was telling fairy tales. And then suddenly this big, oh, let's say from the lobby of this building up to the top, hovered over us. It was colored orange-green, had blue feet. Do you suppose you were seeing something flying over you that was blue and orange and green, and you were confused as to what it was? It was like it was flying, kind of. At this point, I felt I had made a mistake with my last question. It was so heavily weighted with suggestion. I sat in my chair, haunted by what my son had said. I will relate a dream I had had shortly before we spoke. The three of us were together in an English countryside in my dream. We had rented a cottage. Inside of the cottage was identical to our cabin. I was confused because Anne and our son were not there, and it was already evening. I was sitting up in bed when I got a call on the phone. I remember saying to the caller, No, it's all right. They're just staying out all night. On some level, I was full of fear, but on another, I seemed to have accepted their disappearance by justifying it to myself. In the middle of the night, there was a knock at the front door. I opened it to find my son in the company of a group of rescue workers, ordinary men and women with deep, soft and loving faces. My son was naked except for a dark blue cap that one of them had put on his head. He was moving strangely, as if he had no control over his muscles. His eyes looked as if he were in some sort of trance. I gathered him up in my arms because they told me that touch and hugging would bring him back to normal. Then I looked around for my wife. They shook their heads sadly, and the care and love radiating from their eyes was such that I was not bereaved but reassured that she would be back soon. Then I was abruptly transported to another place. I was given to understand that Anne and our son had been found here, hiding. It was a cornfield, just like our son's dream. At bedtime that night, he wanted to talk more about his dreams. I did not record our conversation, but he complained of two things. The first was that when he started to go to sleep, his whole body would tingle, and he would feel as if his hair was standing on end. A voice would then ask him about his day, how he felt, and private things which he did not wish to discuss with me. He also complained that he saw a skeleton looking at him when he was trying to relax. The conversation went as follows. A skeleton? Yes. 
and it keeps staring at me like it was right in front of my face and it won't go away. What does it look like? Well, it's, uh, it's not a skeleton. It's one of the thin ones that stood around behind the doctors. What thin ones? You know, the thin ones that are always saying, we won't hurt you, them. It's not a skeleton, it's one of the thin ones. The appearance of these people has never been discussed with my son at all, not by anybody, and yet his description of short ones and taller thin ones is not only consistent with my own observations, it is consistent with the experiences of many of the other people who have encountered the visitors. My historical survey has found that the core experience of seeing flying disks and small figures goes back a long, long time. I have spent a great deal of time in the past few months searching what could only be described as a morass of literature on the subject of unidentified entities and their craft. I have talked to scientists who think that it's all nonsense and to scientists who are not so sure. I have read dozens of case histories and have met many people who have had visitor experiences. Something is happening. This is clear. It is not a version of known phenomena. There is some small reason to speculate that the United States government may have had some sort of communication from visitors as early as the late 1940s, as well as obtained pieces of crashed discs and bodies of the occupants. I base this notion on the two best pieces of evidence I could find, both of which I have personally investigated and confirmed as genuine. These two pieces of evidence are certainly real, in the sense that they are not witting hoaxes. The first document is a letter written by Dr. Robert I. Sabaka, dated November 29, 1983, addressed to Mr. William Steinman, a UFO researcher who has inquired about Starbacker's government consulting activities during the late 40s. Dr. Sabaker was a Department of Defense Research and Development Board consultant during the Eisenhower administration. Educated at Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and Princeton, he is the author of Hyper and Ultra High Frequency Engineering, Research Accrediting at Military Establishments, and the Encyclopedia Dictionary of Electronics and Engineering. Dr. Sarbacker writes in part, Relating to my own experiences regarding recovered flying saucers, I had no association with any of the people involved in the recovery, and have no knowledge regarding the dates of the recoveries. About the only thing I remember at this time is that certain materials reported to have come from flying saucer crashes were extremely light and very tough. I am sure our laboratories analyzed them very carefully. There were reports that instruments or people operating these machines were also of very light weight, sufficient to withstand the tremendous deceleration and acceleration associated with their machinery. I remember, in talking with some of the people at the office, that I got the impression that these aliens were constructed like certain insects we have observed on Earth. I still do not know why the high order of classification has been given and why the denial of the existence of these devices. My hypnotic transcripts continually refer to my impression that I was dealing with creatures that moved like insects. I did not know of Dr. Sarbacker and his letter until August the 9th, 1986, months after I had my experiences. My second piece of evidence that the government may know more about this than that is saying is a small but telling one a press release that was issued in July 1947. In that month, an incident took place on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico, that is the granddaddy of all the government has UFO alien bodies rumors. Throughout 1947, there were many reports in the New Mexico newspapers of odd lights. But the first modern flying disc sighting near Mount Rainier, Washington, 
had been heavily publicized at the time, and some of the New Mexico sightings may have been the result of confused observations of two V-2 launches at White Sands. One took place on June 12th and another on July the 3rd. However, on the evening of July the 2nd, something was seen by members of the public in the skies over Roswell and reported locally. This object was brightly lit and crossed the skies in a northwesterly direction. On July the 8th, the Roswell Army Air Base issued a release which was published, among other places, in the San Francisco Chronicle. The release was issued by Public Relations Officer Lieutenant Walter Hout on order from the base commander, and it read, The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Action was immediately taken and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Jesse A. Marcel to higher headquarters. Later, a report was issued to the effect that this disc was a crushed weather balloon. Under the headline, Disc Solution Collapses, the Chronicle reported that General Roger M. Ramey had stated that the wreckage was a high-altitude weather observation device that consisted of a box kite and a balloon. Later, in the same story, General Ramey is reported to have said that it was a star-shaped tinfoil target designed to reflect radar. Since General Ramey claimed to have the debris in his office, it is strange that he could not seem to settle on an identification for it. Much has been made of the fact that the original discoverer of the device rancher W. W. Brazel was quoted by the Associated Press as being sorry he told about it and describing what he found as tinfoil and other debris. There are three enormous problems with the credibility of the rancher's statements. The first is that he was held incommunicado for days before he made them. The second is that members of his family have asserted that he made them under duress and his being held incommunicado, which is a matter of record, would certainly support that assertion. The third problem is more telling because it does not rely on the rancher's verisimilitude at all. It is that none of the officers originally involved ever thought that they were dealing with the remains of known objects or they never would have allowed their press release to be issued in the first place. Was Mr. Brazel interrogated in order to induce him to change his story? There seems to be no other logical conclusion. The inescapable fact of the Roswell affair is that a group of professionally competent Air Force officers caused the publication of a press release claiming that the Air Force had recovered a crashed flying disc after observing the debris. Only after this release was published was any attempt made to change the story. Even then, neither the release nor the professional competence of its author, his base commander, or the concerned intelligent officers was ever called into question. Publicly, or, as far as I was able to discern, in internal Air Force procedures. Instead, the original witness, who was in no position to know what he had actually seen, was placed under duress and compelled to change his story. It appears that there is more than a shred of evidence that there are visitors here and that they are doing something that involves us. It is also obvious from their secrecy that they want very much to hide. Can it be that the government is inadvertently helping them to do this or even that they have somehow compelled it to act as it does? Certainly, the combination of visitor and government secrecy has led to profound public confusion. We do not know what is going on. Maybe the visitor experience is what happens when the human mind looks into the mirror and discovers that its own reflection 
is not only real, but fearful to see. Something is here, but what and from where? We come at last to the essence of the mystery. We do not and cannot know the actual condition of life elsewhere in the universe because we are presently too ignorant of conditions outside our own immediate solar neighborhood. However, judging from the amount of evidence available, it may be possible to expand our knowledge simply by taking the flying disk and the abductive phenomena seriously. We may or may not find visitors, but we would certainly find a body of data so compelling and multidimensional in its complexity that merely stating useful hypothesis about it is going to be a major challenge, not only to the physical and behavioral sciences, but also to the science and art of language. It is our American habit to assume that there is something irrelevant, even a little silly, about the past. Our relationship to former times is expressed as nostalgia, not history. When our government first started studying flying saucers in the late 40s, it never even occurred to anybody official to consider having a look at the past. Here are two stories. In the little town of Merkel, Texas, on April 26, 1897, a group of people going home from church at night allegedly saw a heavy object dragging along the ground. They followed it until it bounced across a railroad track and caught on one of the rails. It was an anchor tied to a rope. When they looked up, they saw an airship with lighted windows and a headlight on the front, brighter than the light of a locomotive. Ten minutes passed, and soon a man was seen coming down the rope, he was small and wearing a blue sailor suit. When he saw the people, he cut the rope and the ship sailed off into the night, leaving the anchor behind. The small beings I first saw were dressed in dark blue coveralls. This is not a unique description of the visitor's garb. Perhaps it is sort of a night uniform. One Sunday, in the borough of Cloriera in Ireland, the parishioners of the church of St. Canarius heard a noise on the roof. They went outside and saw an anchor embedded in the eaves. The anchor line rose up into the sky where there floated a ship on the air. A man leaped overboard and swam down to the anchor. After an altercation with the parishioners, he cut the rope and managed to return to the ship, which sailed away. The anchor remained in the church, uh, but has since been lost. Since this incident took place not in 1897, but around A.D. 1211. During the reign of Papin in the early Middle Ages, the French were bothered by apparitions that were seen marching through the sky, camped out in tents on the reaches of heaven and sometimes in wonderfully constructed aerial ships that flew past in veritable squadrons. People were annoyed at the presence of all this unquenchable grandeur and happiness, and both Charlemagne and his successor, Louis the Debonair, imposed penalties on the tyrants of the air. As counter-propaganda, the sylphs kidnapped people and took them to their airy abode, showing them their world. But when the people were sent home, they were all burned at the stake without a second's hesitation. My point is that there may be far more to this than science or government or even religion can separately address. It would seem that our civilization is not paying attention to what may be the central archetypal and mythological experience of our age. If so, then this is the first time that man has simply refused to respond to the ghosts and the gods. Is that why they have become so physical, so real, dragging people out of bed like rapists in the night? Because they must have our notice in order to somehow be confirmed in their own truth. This may be primarily a matter of visions and chimeras, 
battering at the door of physical reality. They are not simply flickering effects of the mind. Something is out there and wants in. Whomever and whatever the visitors are, their activities go far beyond a mere study of mankind. They are involved with us on very deep levels, playing in the band of dream, weaving imagination and reality together until they begin to seem what they probably are, different aspects of a single continuum. To really begin to perceive the visitors adequately, it is going to be necessary to invent a new discipline of vision, one that combines the mystic's freedom of imagination with the substantial intellectual rigor of the scientist. Maybe there really is another species living upon this earth, the fairies, the gnomes, the sylphs, vampires, goblins, who attach to reality along a different line than we do, but who know and love us, as we do the wild things of the woods, who, perhaps, are trying to save us from ourselves, or whose lives are inextricably linked to our own. If we die, must the gods, the fairies, the elves, then fall into some blue glen of unknowing? Will their secret world go cold without us, or will there only be less excitement? The visitors often appear in threes, they project triangular lights. They have been reported to wear various types of triangular devices and emblems. People see three pyramids or three triangles in connection with them. A huge triangular-shaped object is sometimes sighted. I had triangles etched on my arm. In order to approach an initial understanding of the visitor experience, if that is possible, it might be productive to explore the inner meaning of the triangular shape. There are many ancient traditions that view man as being with three parts, body, mind, and heart. It seems possible that the visitors view themselves as an entire species with three parts, judging from the three distinct basic forms that have been seen. The fundamental idea of the triad as a creative energy is that two opposite forces coming into balance create a third force. The idea of the triad is not static. It is an expression of a series of emanations. The third force emerges when the first and second forces come into balance, and when all three are in harmony, they become a fourth thing, an indivisible whole. When we were first married, Anne and I found a motto for ourselves in the Bible, from Ecclesiastics. Two are better than one, and a cord of three strands is not quickly snapped. Anne cross-stitched it, and it has been with us ever since. The third strand is the love, then the child, then the long unraveling of the years. At last, it is what is left of a lifetime spent together, the fading remembrance, the generations to come, and also the joy that ripens in souls. For there to be a growth instead of death, much more must be brought to the triad than mere conquest, or contact, which, if the visitors are as advanced as they seem, would amount to a form of conquest. Communion is as wide as all the knowledge of both partners, as deep as their whole souls. Marriage requires patience, giving without thought to keep accounts. When one says, I gave this and so I am owed that, the marriage has not yet begun. Real sharing rests in a balanced recognition of sameness and difference. It is a discovery of balances and equalities. We need to give ourselves to our experience without knowing what it is, trusting that our understanding will grow as we proceed. To participate truly 
in this experience, we must marry the unknown. The only belief is the question itself. Love is a matter of leaping out into the sky. We do not even know if there are visitors. We do not know what we are, why this is happening, or exactly what is happening. The real center of the experience lies not in some facile explanation. It lies in opening oneself to the question as it really exists, with all its mystery and danger. Our agony is to stand before the utter blackness of the unknown with full knowledge that there is something there, and it is alive, and if one is to remain on the path of inner search, one must trust it, even though it may very certainly be dangerous. Strength is needed to endure the fire, courage to enter it, intelligence to come out alive. I do not have it in me to be a believer, nor can I be a true skeptic, for I loathe the narrow and love the broad. I cannot say in all truth that I am certain the visitors are present as entities entirely independent of their observers, nor can I say I do not think they are here at all. It is not enough for us to ascribe the visitor experience to some unusual manifestation of known phenomena and then ignore it. Science has not explained the visitors. Indeed, it has not even begun to explore them. Nor is it sufficient to say that higher beings are studying us and remain passively waiting for what titbits of knowledge they may toss us. The visitor experience drives us to extremes. Those who have seen the devices or their occupants are often convinced that they are extraterrestrial in origin and science debunks that, just as the clergy debunked the theories in centuries past, and for the same reason. These outrageous enigmatics so threaten the established order of belief that they must at all costs be rejected. There was no room in 17th century Christian theology for fairies, and there is scarcely more in 20th century scientific theory of visitors as peculiar as these. But the difference between science and theology is that science can make room for new things. Looking back over my experience with the visitors, I cannot say that I felt inferior to them. On the contrary, the people I encountered did not seem superior so much as wiser, but also more simple and unformed as individuals. And they not only feared me, they seemed in awe of me. They are not all powerful super-beings. They are frail, limited individuals, far from home, if indeed this world is not their home. I can discern a visible agenda of contact in what is happening. Over the past 40 or so years, their involvement with us has not only been deepening, it has been spreading rapidly through the society. At least, this is how things appear. The truth may be that it is not their involvement that is increasing, but our perception that is becoming sharper. The evolution of this increase in perception may have a very definite design. We initially noticed objects from afar, then closer. Then we remembered seeing the visitors, and now we are beginning to remember being with them. Will the visitors emerge into our world on a flood of memory? And if so, then why? Look, why not simply land, open the hatch and come out? It could be that they wish to avoid what Cortez did with such eagerness. It is not difficult to crush the flower of a culture's spontaneity. Would we not all risk being lost in non-meaning if an apparently superior visitor culture emerged suddenly into the open? Science, religion, even the arts might be shattered by the appearance of a culture that already knew everything we want to know about the universe. Unless, of course, 
it were to emerge not into blinded awe, but into our understanding of its truth, its strengths, as well as its weaknesses. I would not be at all surprised if the visitors are real and are slowly coming into contact with us according to an agenda of their own devising, which proceeds as human understanding increases. If they are not from our universe, it could be necessary for us to understand them before they can emerge into our reality. In our universe, their reality may depend on our belief. Thus, the corridor into our world could, in a very true sense, be through our own minds. This is not a mere matter to be explained away by one facile dodge or another. It is an immense human reality, vast in its impact and complexity. It has coherence, strange but undeniable, and thus there is certainly a process of thought that will draw it into our understanding. Presently, it is lacking effective definition. To leave it this way, when it seems so rich with potential, would be a shame. But has science the wit to study such an elusive and multidimensional enigma? I say yes, resoundingly so. Even a brilliant but arrogant curmudgeon of my acquaintance, who denounced it all as preposterous, is important to an understanding of it. Blind denial is as empty a response as blind acceptance and operates on the same level of validity. There is no real intellectual difference between the haughty psychiatrist or physicist and his refusal to accept the truth, and the nervous contactee eager to see the phenomenon as a dimensionless cartoon of space friends. We must break through both distortions, and we certainly can. The visitor experience may be our first true quantum discovery in the large-scale world. The very act of observing it may be creating it as a concrete actuality with sense, definition, and a consciousness of its own. And perhaps, in their world, the visitors are working as hard to create us. Truly, such an act of mutual insight and courage would be communion. Two universes spinning each other together. The old weaver of reality rethreading creation's loom. Something is here, be it a message from the stars, or from the booming labyrinth of the mind, or from both. It must have left a signature somewhere, a thread in the snow, the scratch of a strange nail upon a wall. And we can certainly find that thread if we bring humour and honesty and courage and great care to the effort. In taking the thread, we might find ourselves in possession of a very real key to the universe. Once the thread is in hand, our own mythology will tell us where it leads, for it will be the same thread that the maiden Ariadne handed to Theseus when he stood before the maze of the Minotaur, young and strong and mad with courage. And we will all go down the labyrinth to meet whatever awaits us there.